that democracy is one form of governance that is very successful in protecting the interest of the people so that's why you know we are uh, you know protecting cherishing and promoting uh, democracy in different countries and we are fortunate that in india the parliamentary form of democracy has been chosen you know when we got independence and we have been successfully you know you know uh, protecting the, the the this form of democracy the parliamentary form of democracy and with the help of that we are ob- we are able to provide all kinds of necessary you know developmental opportunities for the people in the country the constitution of india is providing all kinds of strength and power to the governing people as well as the people of uh, you know the country to promote the interest of everyone so in this context you know we are going to discuss how democracy as a tool can help uh, the national interests and how this is going to you know help uh, all the citizens of the country in a better you know in a in a you know na- you know living in a in a better manner united nations has declared today september 15th as a day for democracy it has been recognized in 2007 that every year we need to you know observe the international day for democracy from 2018 onwards the 15th september has been celebrated as the international day of democracy and we are today celebrating this day in the context of covid-19 we all know how our lifestyles the governing systems the economics uh, have been affected in different ways due to the covid unexpected you know pandemic and due to the lockdown so the lifestyles the life opportunities and the everything has been affected in one way or the other so now it has become a big challenge for the governing system that how we are going to move forward from this pandemic and how democracy is democracy is going to help us in this uh, process this is what is the major theme that we are going to look at today in the webinar covid 19 a spotlight on democracy in order to discuss this topic we have several distinguished speakers you know uh, here with us the first speaker is professor k purushottam reddy Prusho, Pr- professor purushottam reddy is uh, you know a political scientist a renowned political scientist he was the the former head of the the osmania uh, you know university political science department and uh, he was a professor and head of the department there he was also chairperson of the board of studies in political science department in the osmania university and he has done a lot of work in political science as well as uh, in democratic uh, you know studies he has been a resource person for many you know reputed universities and uh, academic staff colleges he has been a you know regular resource person in uh, andhra pradesh judicial academy mit school of uh, government pune center for cultural resources uh, training and all and uh, he will be speaking <coughs> on democracy through the ages so this is the the topic in which uh, uh, professor uh, purushottam reddy garu will be speaking and he is also representing uh, the capital foundation society this program that we are uh, organizing is being organized by yes jaipal reddy memorial foundation capital foundation society council for green revolution and mandate project you all know that how sri late jaipal reddy garu has contributed for our country and he has been a you know a very renowned uh, uh, you know leader political leader and he was a union cabinet minister several times he has contributed for the the uh, you know the governance of the country in many spheres in different ministries he has contributed and he has also come out with a book on 10 ideologies professor purushottam reddy garu will be speaking about the contributions made by 
Sri Late uh, uh, Jaipal Reddy, and also he will throw light on the work uh, done by you know Jaipal Reddy Memorial Foundation, and he will also you know discuss about the book written by uh, Sri uh, you know Jaipal Reddy sir, and this is uh, you know about our first speaker. I welcome Professor Purushottam Reddy sir for kindly consenting and uh, you know to be part of us uh, you know in the program to make it uh, a grand success. Along with him, we will also have other speakers, Dr. Manaka Guru Swami. Dr. Manaka Guru Swami is a senior advocate, Supreme Court of India, very renowned figure in the field of uh, you know law. Uh, I will introduce uh, all the speakers when you know before when they speak, and uh, we are also. having dr donti narsimha reddy is a public policy expert and consultant and he has been a policy expert on different fields today he will be speaking on recent threatening trends to democracy and rights then we have shri dilip reddy garu so he will be he is the the principal of sakshi school of journalism and he is part of uh, you know council for green revolution he will be speaking on role of media during pandemic in democracy we have shri harsh bedi the founder of uh, the mandate project and he is a young dynamic leader and he is trying to you know promote accountability and transparency in all governance systems with the help of uh, technology invention interventions he will be speaking on the role of technology in promoting democracy and we are very fortunate to have shri pulapre balakrishnan ji and he is an economist and educationist and he will be speaking on what the pandemic has revealed about india's democracy and uh, i welcome all the the speakers once again all the participants once again i also thank the organizers shri uh, you know yes jaipal reddy memorial foundation capital foundation society new, new delhi council for green revolution and mandate project for providing this kind of a platform to discuss uh, the importance of democracy now we will go to uh, our first speaker professor k purushottam reddy sir to speak on democracy through the ages over to you sir so thank you very much uh, really it's a very important day today uh, you made an excellent start for the subject and thank you so much for the kind words said about me we are all gathered here to somehow protect the flame of democracy and i sincerely thank the united nations for having been in the forefront trying to bring the world together discussing major issues and trying to evolve a consensus whether it is international peace or trying to make the world a better place to live by giving an agenda for the nations of the world initially you know the mdgs or the millennium development goals and slightly before that they gave a small prescription known as agenda 20 agenda 20 uh, then we come to we come to the present uh, agenda before the world and that is sustainable development goals we are in the fifth year and incidentally goal number 16 it talks about peace justice level playing ground strong institutions rule of law and so on thank you sir for the wonderful introductory remarks i am focusing on the book of uh, jaipal reddy garu i had one advantage <coughs> with him together we were both in the same college and he was our president not only the president of the college but he also became the president of the 
entire university. Those days we had uh, university elections in Osman University. And he was the president of the entire university, which means spread over the entire Telangana. Such was his uh, uh, leadership and uh, he would inspire uh, youngsters those days on the higher values of life. He wrote this book uh, slightly, you know, uh, after becoming the best parliamentarian of the country. All the ideas were, uh, were constantly with him. Maybe he was mentally fine tuning them because he himself was an activist and trying to experiment. But after, towards the later part of his life, he, he very seriously involved himself and he started writing. This book, 10 Ideologies, he wrote it because I one sentence I want to read from the cover of the book. And that explains why this particular book is so very significant. In his own words, today, ideology seems to have become irrelevant. However, he feels that if social ideologies are extinguished, primordial cultural identities based on religion, race, or nation will resurrect themselves, thereby fragmenting society further. And this he was uh, against because the world has already witnessed during the First World War, Second World War, particularly Second World War, which was fought in the name of ideology. And we had all kinds of ideologies right from fascism, Nazism, communism, democracy, and so on. And the World War can be described as a battle of ideologies, but not fought intellectually, but fought with deadly weapons resulting in millions of deaths. In his book on 10 ideologies, there is a chapter on democracy. And I, my humble request to all the youngsters who have joined today, we'll make the soft copy available in due course. And I request all of them to please read this wonderful chapter of democracy because here Jaipal Ridigaru traces the idea of democracy over a very long period of two, two and a half thousand years, 2,500 years. So friends, uh, in view of the limited time, I wish to state that whenever there is an idea at the global level, simultaneously, a lot of people get the same idea. As for example, when we are talking about democracy, in our own country, we had a republic known as Vaishali in, in Bihar of today. And Vaishali was a wonderful republic. And it, it, was, it was a case study of direct democracy. Similarly, in Greece, in Athens, Athens was very, very popular, very famous example of a direct democracy. However, there were some limitations. We, we always need to ide appreciate an idea in the context of its time. I'm not saying, I'm not judging Athens with today's standards, but Athens 2,500 years ago, depending, you know, taking those standards into consideration, it was an ideal uh, democracy. And uh, though citizenship was not universal, it's not like India today, where everybody is equal when it comes to political voting. There were restrictions, there was slavery, and women were not still allowed to vote. So it was only the universal application was limited to male, and uh, the, the number of citizens was approximately 1,20,000. 
I am not saying that they would all all the one lakh twenty thousand would gather at a particular place. No, but depending upon the issue, any citizen could go and directly make a make his presentation. So that's how, depending upon the problem, the issues, the citizens within inverted commas they were free to participate. And those days, Athens was very lucky to have a great leader by name Pericles. Pericles is one of the greatest of the great, a great orator, one who stood by the suffering people, always trying to uplift the poorest of the poor. And those days, he, of course, there were elections; he was elected, but not once. The greatest of the Greek uh, political thinkers, they have commented. That Pericles was so popular that he could have been endlessly elected. Endlessly, unfortunately, after about twenty-five years of his uh, leadership, there was plague in Athens, and that was the time when Athens was fighting a war with Sparta, and Sparta was a military uh, dictatorship. Unfortunately. Plague destroyed Athens' uh, leadership, and Pericles also died. And after his death, Athenian democracy ended. Now the question is: Their democracy had taken roots, but unfortunately, there were no strong institutions to carry forward the message of democracy. Athenian democracy ended with Pericles, so that is why we should not be focusing on individuals. The political who is very particular, he mentions that if only there were strong institutions created, the message of democracy, democracy as a form of government, would have survived. Well, that did not happen. Now we go a little further. All of us, whenever we are reminded of. Ancient Greece, we are reminded of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Alexander. <clears throat> the first three were great thinkers. Alexander was, you know, he became a—I I won't say great, but he was a conqueror. Socrates, uh, the, I'm not going into the details of these three thinkers right now. It's not necessary. Socrates was a philosopher par excellence, and uh, the very fact that he was uh, condemned to death by the rulers then—that is, so the ideas and the questions that uh, Socrates, Socrates raised—it was causing inconvenience to the rulers of the day, <laughs> and they sentenced him to death, and uh, they asked him to drink a cup of poison, which. He he took uh, willingly, but then he gave a great speech. That particular speech is all time great. So we need to understand that Socrates has been silenced, but then the voice of the people cannot be silenced. Dissent will always be there. Free thinking has got to be encouraged. After Socrates, the next major figure is plato a great thinker and his books republic laws and statesmen the first one deals with uh, a utopia there is no mention of democracy there because his in in the republic it was all a government by the philosopher king and the guardians but his later books were uh, it speak they speak volumes about his increasing interest In some kind of a continuity, some kind of a solid uh, rules and regulations. Though apologetically, Plato mentions uh, about uh, statesmen, and he also speaks about laws. But he definitely these two books were not his best. Plato is known the world over because of because of his wonderful dream. That is republic. 
Then we have Aristotle. About Aristotle, it is said that he discussed, he went through, he analyzed 120 constitutions. Now the point is, 2,500 years ago, 120 states had constitutions. And Aristotle went, he read all the constitutions, he classified the constitutions. So that only means that those days, mostly they were city-states and each city had its own constitution. And Aristotle's contribution is in many fields. He can be described as a forerunner of the concept of uh, the theory of separation of powers. He spoke about revolutions. He spoke about the middle classes as a bulwark against uh, revolutions. He spoke about how government changed from bad to better, and uh, he also spoke about the citizenship responsibilities. Friends, we go a little further. I'm not uh, interested in Alexander, but unfortunately what happened after that is the entire Greece, which was captured by initially by Alexander, was captured and dominated by the Roman Empire. And about the Roman Empire, we need to understand that uh, till Julius Caesar came onto the stage, Rome had a history of representative government. Again, not on ideal terms, we cannot judge those governments by today's standards, but definitely they were senators, they were consuls. Julius Caesar was a consul and he was killed or eliminated because there was this lurking fear that Caesar may become an emperor. But after his death, the Roman democracy became the Roman Empire. And that continued for nearly 2000 years. Friends, we go a little further. Here we have to understand the role of the church and, uh, you know, after uh, particularly, you know, the rise of the papacy, the fall of Constantinople, say 1400 years from after Jesus Christ. In the 15th century, when Constantinople fell, Constantinople is today's Istanbul, the clerics fl of uh, uh, you know, Istanbul today, the Constantinople, they had to flee with their books. And those days, Bible was the most important book. So with all whatever religious books they had, they had to flee for their life. So as they were fleeing towards the Western side, they took their uh, uh, very important books, manuscripts, etc. And as luck would have it, the printing press came into being and with the advent of the printing press, the Bible was printed first. That was the first book to be printed. And very soon, what was originally limited to, you know, a few clergymen possessing the Bible, very soon hundreds and thousands of people started reading the Bible. We can, we can call it as the beginning of the democratization of the Christian religion. But meanwhile, the church itself got split into two groups. One is the Catholic group, and the other is the Orthodox uh, church. The Catholic group was subjected to certain kinds of democratic, I mean, they were exposed to new ideas, particularly when it comes to Renaissance and sub subsequently uh, Reformation. <coughs> On one side, they were exposed, they were accepting new technologies. So the Catholics started uh, slowly becoming democratic and uh, uh, they were also becoming, uh, taking to modernization. Whereas Orthodox Church, they already wonderfully explained, in Europe, in Europe, the entire northern part of Europe was under the grip of the Orthodox Church. For example, right now, you know, right from uh, uh, 
uh, what we call the Scandinavian countries, the entire former USSR, entire USSR was under the Orthodox Church. And our Orthodox Church did not permit free thinking. And that is why the ideas of Renaissance and Reformation and the ideas, uh, the early winds of democracy did not uh, reach that particular area. And uh, the Paladiaru wonderfully explains how even in the 21st century, even today, as we are all discussing this wonderful subject, you know, the entire Northern Europe, the former Soviet Russia area is blissfully ignorant of democracy. Even today, Russia, though it has elections periodically, Russia is never known as a participatory democracy. Okay, friends, uh, what happened in the uh, Catholic Church subsequently is that some of the priests started selling certificates to their followers, saying that if you wish to have all facilities in heaven, you need to pay so much of money, and these people would give the certificates. And illiterate people, innocent people, having faith in God, always wishing to have a better place after death, <laughs> willing to enjoy life in uh, uh, heaven within inverted commas. They were uh, shelling out huge volume, uh, sum of money, and they were purchasing. Okay. This led to Protestantism. That is, the thinking people among the Catholics, they started questioning, what is this nonsense? How can you sell certificates? This is not fair. You are cheating. And therefore, they protested. And that protest became a great revolution. And that's why today, Protestantism is extremely popular. More number of people, are, uh, uh, it attracts the intelligentsia among the Catholic community. OK. I have to mention, Jepal Adigar was tracing the idea of democracy. And uh, frankly speaking, as a, as a student of political science, I'm really grateful for the wonderful service he has rendered. He made it everything easy for us to follow. And here he goes to he goes on to mention three revolutions. One is the English Revolution, and this English Revolution is in two parts. First, uh, when it was in the 14th century, Magna Carta was signed between the king and the noblemen, and the king very you know reluctantly started sharing some of his very important powers with the nobles of the day. I'm not saying it was a big leap forward, but definitely it was. It resulted in the weakening of the uh, monarch, and to that extent, it is democratic. Then we come to. I'll, I'll come to the English uh, Revolution slightly later again. This is the first part. We come to the American Revolution. Initially, it started as uh, you know as the American War of Independence, but very soon the intelligentsia, particularly Thomas Jefferson. He took the lead and um, he started speaking about, about democracy. And his contribution there is very, very high. He, later on, he himself became the president. He became the third president of America. But frankly speaking, his contribution in the initial years is one of the best. And uh, in the American contribution, it is a tribute to the division of separation of powers as propounded by, here there are about three, four uh, important uh, thinkers. Um, one is Locke, American Constitution owes uh, a lot to John Locke, that is one. Secondly, Montesquieu subsequently. Of course, they were inspired uh, by the Encyclopedia, you know, the group which uh, published the encyclopedia, they were known as the encyclopedic uh, group. Uh, Voltaire was one of the uh, high priest of the French Revolution, Voltaire, Locke, Rousseau, and a whole lot of others. They were, uh, you know, they, they created an environment where the, there was tremendous intellectual churning. I, I, uh, there is a very important quotation 
uh, in Jay Parvati's work, in his own words, he mentions, unless people come together and discuss, there is not, it is not necessary that they should agree with everything. They should deeper, then they should be a tremendous discussion. And this intellectual, you know, churning is very, very important. It creates the right condition, right atmosphere for the survival of democracy. So American constitution uh, came into being. Uh, subsequently, I come to the, uh, you know, uh, Gettysburg speech of uh, Abraham Lincoln, where uh, we all are remember, I mean, we continuously remind ourselves that democracy is by the people, for the people. I mean, of the people, by the people, and for the people. But normally, we tend to forget the last part. See, what uh, Jaipal Hidigaru was emphasizing is, yes, the government should be of the people, by the people. But, but he went on to see, say that it should also be for the people, also be. See, the word also be, he was focusing on that. Okay, government of the people, by the people, but it should also be for the people. I request everyone to note this because we are living at a time when governments are functioning to please a few corporates. No, that is not democracy. Democracy means that the government should work for the people. Every decision, it should be in the interest of the people, not in the interest of a few corporates. Okay. Then we come to 17th century, again UK, and there, um, you know, in 1649, the King Charles I was asked to come to Parliament. There were allegations against him. And uh, there was a big inquiry. And ultimately, he was found guilty. And in the January of 1649, he was killed, executed. This point is very important because we talk about British monarchy. Even today, they have some kind of a monarchy left. They call it as the constitutional monarchy. But in a real democracy, that is not necessary. But anyway, the King of England was executed. And after that, they had Cromwell who pursued democracy. And uh, they were also wonderful uh, poets like John Milton. And uh, uh, we, we have uh, Wordsworth, these two, uh, you know, poets, they were, they, they could be described as the high priest of democracy. They were uh, trying to uh, emphasize the importance of equality in a political system. Simultaneously, as I pointed out in Europe, protest Protestantism was picking up under the leadership of Martin Luther. On one side, uh, you know, they were trying to destroy the vestiges of uh, uh, papacy, you know, full control of the church and all that. And uh, Martin Luther played a great role. But simultaneously, in, in France, it was in the crucible of France, we say. France became the testing ground of several ideologies. And uh, there we find a, more than a hundred thinkers continuously discussing, working, interacting. And uh, they were trying to find solutions to the, uh, to the France of uh, uh, their times. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately for the monarchy, they, did, they could not see the spirit of the times. And uh, there was a tremendous public upsurge. And it is said that when people went to the palace demanding bread, yes, we want bread, we want bread. And the queen, you know, from the balcony seems to have said, if you don't have bread, you eat cakes. And that was the starting point of the French Revolution and uh, hundreds of members of the nobility, so-called nobility, uh, or nobility within inverted commas, they were slaughtered, they were threatened. But uh, that apart, 
the idea of democracy picked up from the French Revolution with the slogans like liberty, equality, and fraternity. And I remember friends during our times, that is Jay Paladi Aru, my senior, when I was there in the college, we were really inspired by the slogans of liberty, equality, and fraternity. I mean, we had a cause, a purpose, an ideology, a framework, and we had committed ourselves to these values. Maybe, maybe because, you know, I started my education in 1950, and uh, that is also the period of the constitution. In the, India started implementing the constitution. So there were very high hopes, and, uh, you know, the spirit of India's freedom struggle was still there in the air. We had tall personalities, you know, wonderful, uh, great speakers like uh, Justice Krishna here. Justice Bhagavati and um, Gajendra Gadkar, Nana Palkiwala. You know, these people, you know, uh, these, apart from being uh, judges, they would reach out to the common man and try to explain the constitution and the importance of value and, and the preamble and so on. So we go a little further. We come to the uh, 20th century. And there we we realize <clears throat> we realize that in spite of the fact, in spite of the fact, the people of the world were trying to you know adjust their lifestyles and work uh, peacefully towards democracy. It so happened that quite a few countries were taken position of by people who later on became dictators. And uh, this we notice in Germany. Hitler took over and slowly he settled down as one of the uh, worst tyrant in history. He conquered the entire power, political power in Germany. Then he expanded in Europe and he became the biggest uh, killer. Simultaneously in Italy, another person, Mussolini, and in Russia in the name of a uh, you know, pro-people ideology, communism, uh, a dictator emerged by name Stalin. And all dictators are the same, whether it is a monarch, whether somebody rises in the name, name of some ideology like Nazism, fascism, communism, or even military dictatorship. You know, dictators are dictators and they are intolerant and anybody who raises a question you know, they, they, the, that person is eliminated. So what happened is, we all think in India that Europe was always democratic or, you know, Europe is the one which gave us these ideas of democracy. Definitely, yes, when we look at the French Revolution. When we look at the American Revolution, yes. Even English Revolution, yes. But then again, we need to realize that in all these countries, women did not have voting till the 20th, 20th century. That is, they were definitely democratic. I mean, they must be good when compared to their own time, but by today's standards, they, can, they can't be. And we need to realize, and uh, you know, Jay he very clearly says, 19, till 1974, 1974, Greece became democratic. That is, a country which boasted of Athenian democracy, it had to wait for more than 2,000 years, and it was only in 1974, Greece became democratic. 1945, Italy, after Mussolini, became a demo democracy. Well, we became free in 1947, and we adopted a constitution which became uh, implementable in 1950. That is, we were not very behind. Italy became a democratic country in 1945. And you know, Portugal became a democracy in 1968. And Spain became a democracy in 1975. Friends, compared to India, many of the European countries became democratic later. We are ahead of them. Now here, uh, there's one point uh, 
uh, I would like to mention. In his own words, I request all of you to note. Jaipal Reddy says that it is important to recognize that a huge intellectual ferment is a necessary condition for liberation from a medieval mindset. Tremendous intellectual churning has to go on continuously. It's not as though it's not just uh, for one day or for, it's not just, uh, you know, one day we observe a day for democracy, but continuously we should be thinking about democracy. We need to be eternally vigilant on this very important subject. And uh, I appreciate uh, Jaipal Redigaru for mentioning this. We come to uh, another important uh, point. Though America was a democracy, England and France, you know, we always quote them, we appreciate them, but to that extent, fine. But we need to realize that uh, democracy did not come to them overnight. It came, you know, piece by piece uh, in installments. And here I would like to mention that, uh, you know, the 1832 reforms bill, you know, it was uh, presented by the working class of UK. And uh, initially the electoral vote, in, there were only five lakh voters in UK then. And uh, after the struggles, 1832 subsequently, we realized that uh, very, very reluctantly, they started giving voting rights to the working class in the villages also. And uh, the number of votes increased uh, to 8 lakhs, 13,000. But then the, the Chartist movement, that is uh, when, they sub when the working class submitted a, a list of uh, what they wanted, uh, I mean, the, what they pleaded for, Number one is manhood suffrage. <laughs> Even they could not uh, think of a universal adult franchise. They demanded only manhood suffrage, annual parliaments, vote by secret ballot, no property qualifications, then payment to members of parliament and equal electoral districts. Though some of these things are valid for all times, the very first one, they could not demand, their thinking was limited, you know, the, the workers demanded only manhood suffrage. And this was in the middle of uh, uh, 19th century. Of course, uh, some of the British prime ministers were quick enough to accept them. Benjamin Disraeli, he agreed and uh, uh, later on, um, the, the manhood suffrage came into being in the 20th century, 1918. And uh, women became voters in 1928. That is, even though England is supposed to be so-called mother of parliaments and all that. But in reality, uh, uh, you know, women, sub voters are not there means, what does it mean? 50% of the people uh, did not have the right to vote. And then they were property, uh, property was one of the considerations for voting. So all this, we have to take into consideration. But one, uh, concludingly, I have to mention about India. Because this is where Jepal Reddy Garu is at his best. His understanding of India, because please remember, friends, that he was a product of his times. And uh, particularly those days, there were tall intellectual chains like Raj Gopalachari. And I remember Jaipal Reddy holding a copy of Swarajya. Swarajya was the publication of Rajaji those days. And uh, he would always carry, carry what we call Bhavan's journal and uh, Reader's Digest and all that. And uh, those days, these books reflected democratic writings, apart from statesmen and all that. So here, uh, uh, his analysis of India is, it makes interesting reading. Why India is an exception? Because, uh, you know, uh, remember friends, we all became free in 1947 and from 1950 we have a constitution, right? But there were several other countries which, we, which came, uh, which became free along with us. There was this Pakistan, there was Nepal. So particularly he gives the example of Pakistan and Nepal. 
and you know he scorches the argument that india continues to be a democracy because we learns democratic uh, values from the britishers because we were their colony okay if that is the factor then pakistan also was a colony then why did not uh, pakistan survive as a democracy pakistan invariably ended as a military dictatorship quite a quite a few times then we uh, there are some people say because india is a hindu majority state there is what is known as the theory of karma and dharma and you know the hindu ethos and then we, if we accept that then they already give the example of nepal nepal is a, a hugely hindu populated state but nepal also did, was not a good ground for the flourishment for the flourishing of democracy so these are some points we need to be careful then what is it that made india or what is it that makes india so great or so comfortable when we are talking about democracy so he analyzes and says that it is india's struggle for freedom india was very very lucky to have had a galaxy of top leaders you know it's not easy thing right from 1857 you know the the social reform movements initially jansi ki lakshmi you know they they protested they were they waged the war but subsequently lot of uh, uh, the bhakti movement uh, the raja ramon roy um, uh, movement and then ari samaj movement and like this uh, tremendous sensitization social awakening uh, took place and uh, by 1918 uh, 1885 when the first uh, indian national congress under the name under the name in the indian association was established it was once again indian association was established by a britisher okay fine but that was the need of the hour and one platform came into being and people of india started uh, you know particularly the english educated indians they started converging on that platform and slowly it started uh, highlighting the problems of the people of india initially the moderates like gopal krishna gokhale madhav govind ranade dada bhai nagar ji kirsha mehta like that but after 1905 when the britishers wanted to divide bengal you know a galaxy of uh, great thinkers like sri arvind do pipin chandra pal bal gangadhar tilak and lala rajput rai they all came into it. and inspired by these several youngsters came and these youngsters were you know they are dubbed as terrorists which is wrong they were people with lot of emotion they were committed to the cause of this country and uh, they sacrificed their life at the altar of mother india and that is bhagat singh bhagat singh chandrashekhar azad and the galaxy of the people who who happily allo risitha ram raj you know it's a it's not a joke you know when a person decides to sacrifice is most important thing that is life to, at the altar of the country uh, at the altar of mother india and the very idea of mother india was given by bankim chandra chatterjee narist by arvindo and you know great stalwarts like uh, ravin nathag and uh, netaji subhash chandra bose so it is not possible to take all the names but hats off to uh, the galaxy of who is who and then enters gandhi and uh, about because jaipal reddy uh, are you know uh, as a contemporary i have always seen a gandhi in him please remember that he was a gandhian to the core a person who believed in non violence and uh, uh, about gandhi he says that gandhi is the one who connected india till then india's freedom struggle was in isolated in you know in different parts of the country and it is only gandhi who connected and uh, that is that is why he becomes father of the nation and one word about gandhi he says see that is the greatness of the person uh, mahatma gandhi the person gandhi mohandas karamchand gandhi that he could attract the attention of the entire country 
everybody he, he was you know people in india the poorest of the poor the illiterate people living in the remotest corners of the country they they saw in gandhi a person whom they can trust and that is why when gandhi ji gave a call of civil disobedience not violent struggles millions of people courted arrest nothing like this ever happened anywhere in the world this is what they politically says and did the and did this did not happen for one day but for nearly nearly 25 to 30 years you know continuously wave after wave indians uh, coming and getting arrested uh, getting beaten up sitting in a satyagraha or performing a hunger strike and that was also the time when india was making its constitution don't ever think friends that uh, freedom came just like that no it is not by anybody's charity it is we the people our ancestors they have struggled very very hard and india is a showcase nowhere in the world this this point is very important ekkada kuda nowhere in the world there is a parallel to indian freedom struggle and the credit goes to mahatma gandhi and the strong leadership that he promoted and the values you know uh, values Uh, you know, it created an ethical uh, uh, atmosphere. Of course, every other factor may have helped. English education, top leadership of India going to UK, studying language. I mean, uh, law, exposed to British parliamentary practices. All that is fine. But, 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 yes, it is. Uh, it is India's freedom struggle, a very unique struggle. and okay we become free we have a parliamentary democracy and continuously you know we are this we are discussing democracy but we are also discussing a tall personality of our contemporary times it's not a joke that uh, they already as a person was elected seven times to parliament and five times to assembly twice the president of the university teacher students organization and continuously he was an inspiration he was he did not agree with mrs indira gandhi when emergency was declared that is he walked the talk chaala mandi maatladtharu gaani cheyar but he walked the talk and one last point which he mentions in the chapter very clearly when he quotes john locke with regards to property he says that in the days to come this property clause because that is likely to be abused by the corporates and he withstood you know when it came to uh, taking on the reliance as a corporate entity we all know that uh, they probably stood for the country and not for the corporates i thank uh, my friend pushpa kumar garu and the organizers for this wonderful opportunity thank you very much thank you very much sir i don't know how to thank you that you know you have given uh, a very detailed historical account of uh, the democracy the struggles we faced all over the world how people in different countries had to sacrifice and when it came to india in how we got into democracy and uh, you know it is the birthplace of democracy also as you have pointed out that vaishali was the you know the yeah. the, uh, the the example that we can always boast of and this is the place that it thrived and uh, we showed to the world that how democracy could function but even though due to historical reasons you know you, you said so it many, so yes, you said right. it yes and due to historical reasons you know that could uh, you know could not continue for some time and now after independence you know we were able to you know revive it and we have been living with the help of uh, you know the constitutional commitments we are upholding the the democracy in our country and now you know it is in shambles it is in uh, you know great uh, difficulties now uh, i think you know this is where you know you are uh, you know the the foundation that now you have created and the points that now you have you know shared with us will really you know prompt us to think more deeper in uh, identifying how we can you know really 
engage ourselves uh, in uh, in shaping this democracy for the benefit of everyone protecting it and upholding it for you know taking the country to a you know greater height uh thank you very much sir for this you know very very insightful talk uh now i'm going to you know uh, announce one uh, you know one small change in the the sequence of the speakers uh Dr. Menaka Guru Swami, she is in the court and uh, she is not able to join right now. She will be joining at twelve o'clock. So, due to this, uh, I, uh, you know, I have moved the speakers. You know, one speaker when she has come to you know twelve o'clock, then you know the other speakers I am requesting, uh, Dr. Uh, you know Donthi Narsimha Reddy to speak next. Then uh, you know followed by him, Sri Dilip Reddy Guru will be speaking. then sri harsh reddy will be speaking next and uh, then uh, dr menaka guru swami will uh, speak then after that it will be followed by uh, sri balakrishnan sir so this is a sequence that we have uh, you know uh, identified i request all of you to you know uh, you know kindly adjust with this uh, minor change uh, now i request uh, dr narasimha reddy sir Uh, to speak on his topic i will introduce uh, dr narasimha reddy sir dr narasimha reddy is a public policy analyst public policy expert and consultant and he is a prominent figure in the you know field of uh, public policy and he is also student of uh, political science now the expert of political science in the the uh, you know the uh, The, the democratic, uh, you know, the the campaigns that he has been leading in the country, and he was a board member of uh, IFOAM Asia, member of a Cotton Advisory Board Committee, and he is also member of Advisory Council of a Textile Exchange, a global non-profit. He has contributed immensely to the public discourse and public, uh, you know, ch challenges, and uh, he has also, uh, you know, provided policy insights uh, for. Uh, electricity seed rice cotton sugarcane sericulture handloom textiles land water and other related areas and immensely in different fields he has provided uh, you know the the policy related uh, inputs and uh, you know his uh, contributions and we are very happy to you know have him here he has also supported and built uh, many campaigns and advocacy programs uh, to protect the interest of the people and the environment So I'm very happy that you know he has joined us to, you know, provide his insights on threats to democracy in this, uh, you know, the present era that we are undergoing. I invite uh, warmly, uh, Dr. Narasimha Reddy, Dhanthi sir, to share his views. Thank you, Dr. Lakshmanan. Uh, I think we have lost uh, some time uh, in my slot. Uh, anyway, I think uh, we had a very good uh, uh, base by Prof. Bhushottam Reddy, who has been teaching me for almost 35 years. Uh, I think uh, uh, you know one uh, he mentioned clearly uh, what uh, Dr. Jay Pal Reddy mentioned that uh, wrote uh, that the, today you can't find ideologies. I think it is true. Uh, normally, we associate uh, political parties with a particular ideology. I mean, that was there before, and uh, each of the political parties uh, used to uh, talk about. Uh, I mean, they emerged uh, based on a certain ideology. But uh, today, I don't see that uh, ideological base uh, uh, in any political party. So, which is very confusing, and uh, because uh, there is no clarity on what they are talking, what is the motive behind that. So, uh, this why I am saying all this is uh, when I am discussing threats to democracy. Usually, we slot uh, who is doing what and try to see uh, where I am leading to. I am talking about democracy, and. Uh, I'll uh, deal mostly with public policy, not uh, the uh, wider uh, uh, 
uh, arc of uh, democracy, which, which was in, enunciated by Professor Purushottam. So here uh, we are just uh, looking at uh, what democracy means in terms of uh, public policy making. A participation, I think uh, public participation in policy making is, uh, uh, has been flagged uh, before and now as well. Uh, participatory democracy is all about it and then prior consent. So prior information and then consent uh, is also uh, a very important factor. Consultation, access to information and importantly representation. Uh, representation and parliament, legislature, but also in policy making. I think uh, the I think these are the uh, important factors, and uh, my discussion will be uh, surrounding the, these uh, factors in public policy. Uh, now we are seeing a lot of distortions uh, to these uh, democratic principles. Uh, coming from uh, different areas. One, a trade. You know, if you look at uh, uh, pre-1995 trade uh, discussions, uh, GATT-related uh, discussions, and then the emergence of uh, World Trade Organization, and subsequent uh, uh, discussions for agreement uh, on various uh, trade uh, uh, trade agreements. Uh, you know, there is this uh, democratic space uh, constriction uh, we could see. So the countries uh, which are mostly suppliers, I think uh, their democracy eroded a lot. And ultimately, you know, even the promoters of uh, uh, international trade, especially uh, America, Europe, uh, all the developing countries, now they have abandoned that uh, platform itself. And uh, technology, of course, you know, we are talking of different technologies, and technology is invariably used to uh, you know, uh, overcome uh, uh, these uh, factors uh, which are important for democracy. It is almost uh, used as a screen, smoke screen, uh, to uh, you know distort the democracy. And then uh, investment. You know, if you today uh, when you talk, uh, you know, petrobody or investment, uh, uh, petrobody and telu, I think investment has become uh, a ruling. Uh, uh, because uh, we uh, openly invite uh, investment, uh, but not looking at the principles of uh, democracy, uh, which are required. And supply chains, you know, as uh, global supply chains have been established in the last 15, 20 years, these supply chains had a, a very great uh, negative influence on the democratic processes. I think processes uh, are very, very important. Even UN uh, Secretary General today, uh, in a note on uh, International Day of Democracy, mentioned processes are always important. And most of the supply chains uh, you know, cut short those uh, processes and uh, uh, you know, try to look at the only profit. And ultimately, you know, in general, consumerism has been a major uh, threat to uh, democracy everywhere. So, uh, so all in all, you know, not only these. Uh, what we are seeing is a straight line equation uh, between, uh, you know, uh, a straight line equation of profit motive. What I get out of it, and that that has uh, you know uh, uh, blown up from an individual, uh, you know of uh, thinking to the global systemic level. I think that's a major uh, issue which we are looking at. So methods of distortion. We have seen uh, policy reports uh, being prepared by private actors. Uh, this I'm talking about uh, not only in India and uh, various, uh, even uh, European Union we are seeing, uh, and even in America where uh, democracy is supposed to be at a very high level. Data access uh, becomes restricted. So that we are seeing in India and even at the state level. Uh, so only people uh, with a profit motive get uh, that data access. Representation on committees. Nowadays, you see a lot of committees are appointed, but uh, the representation is on those committees is restricted. 
So not all stakeholder groups, particular public policy, find representation in that. You will find mostly the business uh, class or the production, uh, uh, major uh, production groups. And then, uh, you know, uh, when we're talking of participation in public policy, earlier policies and acts or notification, uh, they used to get a wider uh, uh, dissemination. But now, only on particular domains, uh, these are hidden and uh, very few people uh, have that open access unless they go, go and look out for it. And then there is no outward communication on such a draft policy. So a draft policy is loaded uh, on a website, which is usually uh, not uh, visited by anyone. And even that uh, uploading uh, is not uh, communicated uh, uh, through a press release or through media. So ultimately, uh, either you have to do nosing around, otherwise uh, you may not have access at all. Language has been flagged uh, for long. So uh, central government, uh, union government, uh, you know, language is only English and Hindi, though we consider many other languages as national languages. And India is a diverse uh, uh, speaking country. Uh, commenting period, you know, again, uh, it's very short, uh, usually 30 days, 15 days, 20 days. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, getting uh, a wider uh, commenting period itself becomes a campaign. Uh, then public hearings are far and few. Are where, and uh, even if you respond, where, you know, overcoming all these barriers, uh, you don't get any response on the feed. -in. So you might have done a lot of exercise in uh, uh, feeding uh, uh, your uh, opinion or uh, mobilizing opinion, but then uh, there will be silence on that. And it may not be uh, considered at all. And importantly, I think uh, legislatures are kept outside uh, the discussion, which, you know, if we have seen in 1995 when uh, India signed the WTO agreement, uh, WTO agreement was not given to the Indian parliament, though uh, parliament uh, uh, ratified that agreement. And since then, we are seeing many uh, aspects of policy kept outside. Uh, so export policy, defense policy, uh, uh, many other policies are still outside the legislation. <clears throat> now I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, some are good and some, and many are bad. This is a comparative perspective. Um, many of you might know, uh, you know around 2008, nine, uh, we had this discussion on uh, BT brinjal, whether uh, we should allow a genetically modified crop uh, uh, BT brinjal. Uh, I think uh, at that time, Ram Ramesh took a uh, wise decision in a uh, you know, uh, enabling uh, public hearing all over India and uh, for a four month period, I think 120 days, all over India, there were a lot of discussions uh, and even scientific community was asked to feed in. And ultimately there was a overwhelming uh, rejection of uh, uh, BT Brinjal. I think this should go as a, uh, you know, positive example, uh, uh, whenever uh, we are trying to bring a new technology, because the argument uh, by this uh, technology promoters is technology is always good and uh, technology uh, is uh, required. But then it has to, the decision has to be taken by the people. So I think uh, when technology science, uh, which uh, look like uh, more uh, purely technical and uh, uh, requires specialist knowledge, even there, uh, public consultations uh, are required, and uh, BT Brinjal established that uh, need. And uh, by a P uh, pesticide management bill, uh, you know, that was hanging since 2008. But at least in the last two years, uh, it was put on the public domain, and uh, there was some discussion. And right now, it is in parliament. Probably uh, today or tomorrow, it will be taken up for uh, passing in Rajya Sabha. And, uh, and Lok Sabha, but still, though uh, you know uh, uh, there are problems with the bill, 
the process uh, was at least uh, more participatory. Now, a, a decreasing level of goodness we can see is the GST. GST, you know, there was a lot of discussion among state governments and union government, but public participation was very low in that. And ultimately, we are seeing GST. Uh, GST promised a single national tax, but now uh, there are four different kinds of taxes, and even taxing, uh, uh, you know, is a matter of uh, controversy. And uh, ultimately, Parliament has no clue what is happening with the GST because GST Council is autonomous, and uh, I don't think uh, Parliament has yet reviewed uh, the decisions of GST. Now, recent uh, environment impact assessment uh, notification 2020, again, of course, it was put up on the website and uh, commenting period uh, increased uh, from 45 days to 90 days. Uh, I, I think that is, uh, in process terms, it is fine, but uh, ultimately now uh, it is still in the red because uh, whether 2 lakh, uh, I think 20 lakh uh, comments have been, uh, people have commented, uh, we are not sure how much uh, of that feedback will be taken. Now, uh, currently, the big discussion is on data protection. The citizens' data, I think it is being uh, uh, taken uh, in, uh, through various forms, uh, right from Aadhaar card. And now there is a data of uh, privacy, uh, personal data protection bill. I think between all uh, these uh, measures, uh, people are aware because uh, the privacy concerns are being raised, but our government has not yet, uh, responded on that. And when we see demonetization has been brought in uh, basically to digitize uh, uh, the economy, I think uh, again, uh, public participation, consultations have been very low there. So data concerns are still uh, there and uh, we are not sure how this will be taken, but yet uh, the bill has been put up and then Niti Aayog has uh, recently put out a discussion paper. So there is uh, uh, at some level some discussion, but I think uh, we need to deepen the process behind that. Trade agreements, you know, uh, though the people have been counting, but uh, again, uh, it has not uh, deepened uh, to the extent uh, our democracy uh, demands. Now, negatives, you know, as I mentioned, uh, Aadhaar is completely imposed uh, kind of policy. Uh, BT cotton seeds, uh, which were brought in 2003, again, uh, they came in without uh, any discussion, consultation, and acceptance, and uh, farmers are facing a lot of problems. Suicides have, have, are happening. The cost has increased and the contamination of uh, uh, no, the genetic material is continuous. And uh, now we're seeing illegal uh, HTPT cotton seeds are coming. So the whole uh, seed uh, sector has become a mess uh, because of this uh, process of uh, imposing a decision uh, in the uh, one committee of a few uh, scientists, scientists or technocrats are sitting and deciding. So that's where you know you can see the comparison between BT brindle and BT cotton seeds. So India being a major agricultural country, all agricultural decisions, I think though they have to be uh, 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 through a uh, participatory process. But if you see the recent uh, ordinances, three ordinances, one. Uh, uh, and to Essential Commodities Act and to uh, Contract Farming Act and the Trade Facilitation Act. All these three together try to centralize the uh, entire uh, process of decision making. In fact, uh, coming to that, uh, in recent, uh, uh, you know, just one or two years and recent months, we are seeing more in new union government uh, centralizing many state uh, subjects like electricity. Uh, water and then uh, agriculture and uh, uh, you know even in data protection, environmental uh, protection. I think in all these areas uh, there is uh, there are elements of centralization and uh, I think uh, the problem does not lie only with the union government. 
I think even state government, the rogue uh, behavior by some state governments uh, headed by local uh, regional political parties, uh, I know the, that has uh, pushed the uh, union government to probably to centralize. But this the overall anti-federalism uh, trend, uh, I think that is again uh, a, a cause of concern uh, on this day. Uh, demonetization, of course, we know it was suddenly imposed and ultimately the people who uh, were at loss were uh, uh, the common people and not the black, mar black economy merchants or you know, holders of cash. Uh, seed bill, you know, this has been hanging since 2004. Now it's almost 18, uh, 17 years. Farmers are facing lots of problems, but uh, uh, the bill has not yet come only because uh, you know, governments uh, have not enabled a public participatory process uh, behind that bill. Recently, uh, you know, just uh, during COVID, uh, we have seen abolition of uh, All India Handloom Board and uh, All India Power Loom Board, All India Handicrafts Board, a number of bodies, uh, statutory bodies, which were established to help at least 10 to 15 crore artisan population have been uh, you know, abolished just by a notification without any uh, prior consultation or notification. I think these are, the, these are again a cause of concern. And uh, this abolition, you know, the uh, basic uh, premise given is uh, uh, to save uh, money uh, because union uh, government is facing the shortage of funds. But then uh, the, these bodies have been interlocutory bodies and uh, they are participatory platforms. And uh, just because uh, the expenditure is uh, hardly in lakhs, uh, they have been removed. I think that's a uh, uh, motive behind that. So primarily we are looking at uh, threats to democracy in the various small, small steps. I think uh, that is very uh, serious concern. Uh, what is needed is, uh, I think, uh, we require parliamentary oversight, uh, uh, especially, you know, when you uh, just to mention uh, irrigation projects, water allocation, national water policy. I think these are not uh, uh, happening uh, under the parliament. And uh, in the past, you know, if you look at agriculture uh, department funds, 12,000 crores uh, uh, to the erstwhile Andhra Pradesh. It was given uh, and uh, that money went into uh, uh, private accounts of the officials. And ultimately states give only utilization certificates. So there are many processes which do not come under audit or oversight of the parliament or legislature. Uh, in fact, it should have been, we should have included many of them but uh, you know, now we are seeing many of them who are going outside the uh, frame of that parliamentary oversight. So even though we have uh, several parliamentary uh, statute, uh, standing committees, their mandate uh, has become restricted and uh, they do only routine uh, oversight. Of course, there are some committee reports which are very good and uh, uh, which are path breaking, but I think uh, we need to, uh, you know, strengthen this uh, parliamentary oversight, and uh, we need to look at how to depoliticize statutory institutions, enable more transparent appointments, and uh, avoiding conflict of interest whenever uh, uh, people are appointed on these uh, statutory regulatory institutions like the uh, Food Safety Standards Authority of India, Electricity Regulatory Commission. Uh, even as the election commission of India. All these uh, statutory institutions are now a uh, cause of concern, including uh, Central Information Commission. So I think we need to think uh, how to depoliticize uh, uh, these institutions and uh, restore their integrity and, uh, uh, and uh, so that uh, people can trust them. And uh, we need restoration of federal systems and platforms like uh, I know the National Development Council, you know, in the last uh, few years, we have not seen any meeting by National Development Council. 
uh, I think uh, those kind of platforms need to be revived and strengthened. Uh, instead of GST Council, I think GST should have been part of National Development Council. Uh, and then periodical public review of institutions, whatever that might be, I think there has to be a review, public review, and audit uh, systems have to be more encompassing. And ultimately, like uh, what uh, Gandhi has uh, been saying, I know Gandhian thought, where Panchayat Raj institutions have to be uh, strengthened. And uh, ultimately, I think uh, we need a wider and wider representation at various levels. Uh, and not only counties, even in the legislatures, you know, you can see increasingly we are seeing uh, representation only by the uh, rich people, uh, but not uh, coming from different sections of the people. So I think uh, this uh, representation, how to enable a wider representation, I think we have to think about it and see so that uh, if we do this, only uh, our democracy can be uh, saved. Otherwise, uh, we have seen in the last uh, three months uh, during COVID, uh, how Epidemic Act has been uh, misused by certain state governments uh, in uh, you know, filing cases against people who are voicing uh, concerns about uh, the healthcare systems, uh, uh, which have been uh, uh, very problematic. So I think uh, these uh, anti-democratic trends uh, need to be countered and uh, we need to think of innovative ways on how we can uh, counter these trends. So I'll uh, stop it here and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, sir. Wonderful. I really thank you, sir, for uh, you know, sharing your uh, very important views about the, uh, the trends that now going on in the country. Uh, one of the, the first points that you have raised is that the, the policy, uh, you know, being promoted, you know, it's not usually, you know, we used to get inputs from different stakeholders and the corporates are one of the people's, you know, they used to give the inputs, but nowadays, you know, I see personally, I have also seen some of the, the policies, you know, being mooted and prepared by the corporates themselves to suit their own needs. And it is really a disturbing trend. There is no problem if they come out with a draft. That's not an issue at all. If it is all inclusive of taking care of all the uh, people's interest. So this is how the democracy is now shaping. And you have also very well, you know, connected with the different examples with the comparative view where, you know, what are the good trends? What are the bad trends went on? You know, it's really, uh, you know, giving a very sharp uh, insight into the, uh, the happenings. So thank you very much. I think you know, we need to be very uh, careful and aware of uh, the, the, the developments happening. And, and uh, it is only with the help of our participation and our uh, you know, uh, vocal presence and creating public opinion that you know, we'll be able to overcome these difficulties. So thank you very much for uh, you know, providing such a, uh, important input, sir. And now, you know, I would like to uh, uh, welcome uh, Mr. Harsh Bedi. Uh, Mr. Harsh Bedi is a lawyer and the founder of a Mandate Project. Uh, you know, this Mandate Project is to facilitate better coordination between experts, civil society, and policy practitioners on various issues to promote, uh, you know, accountability, uh, uh, transparency, and uh, you know, the, the 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 efficient functioning of the the governmental system. And he has special interest in uh, policy and international uh, relations. And he has been working on governance structures, policy networks, regulatory frameworks, uh, and problem solving through tech-based innovations. Uh, Harsh is, uh, you know, basically coming from, uh, you know, Stevens College and uh, Campus Law Center uh, uh, Law Faculty, Delhi University. And he has also graduated from the, the Graduate Institute, Geneva. He has a wide knowledge, wide, uh, you know, well-experienced, uh, you know, lawyer. And uh, very recently, uh, he had led a very successful a nationwide campaign, a consultation program on draft EAA notification 2020. So this has really helped uh, the, the Minister of Environment Forest. The, the report has been submitted to the ministry. So I very warmly welcome Harsh to share his views on the role of technology in promoting democracy. Over to you, Harsh. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, sir. 
am i am i audible yeah very much yeah okay. so good afternoon uh, no it's still morning so i it's been moved forward i was assuming that we would be starting a little i would be starting later yes so good morning everyone it's still morning uh, it's an honor to be on today's panel with such distinguished speakers i've already had the privilege of working under the guidance of dr l pushpa kumar and i've interacted with dr donthi nasima reddy on a previous occasion which is the eia uh, consultation program that's so mentioned so it's wonderful to see both of you again i've been listening carefully to dr pushottam reddy and dr nasima reddy and thank them for their educative talks which have covered the history values and threats to democracy quite comprehensively and they've raised very important points so i'll do my best to avoid restating what they've already covered as best i can I'd like to begin by placing our discussion on democracy in the present context. Identify certain challenges and then move towards the role of technology in promoting democratic practices. So I'll be speaking of democracies generally and will situate the discussion on India at certain points. Now in the context of COVID-19, we're of course facing Arsh, a global can you be, uh, Arsh, can you be a little louder? I can is it is it not audible? No, oh, it is, but low. Can you be allowed? I I can try. <clears throat> okay. So with with COVID nineteen, we are facing a global health crisis, which has turned into an economic crisis. Or as we can see, the measures implemented by governments across the world have been largely reactionary rather than based on a systematic and prepared response. We witness governments enacting emergency provisions to enforce lockdowns. and there has been a consequent centering of power in the executive branch of the government this is likely to have long term and far reaching consequences while such measures are not undemocratic in themselves they do tend to undercut civil liberties and participatory decision making good electoral practice institutional checks and balances non discrimination and media independence I think the risk of such erosion alone is sufficient reason to keep constant vigil on the short and long term effects of growing centralized power. While assessing state action during a crisis it's important to keep in mind that measures must be proportionate and justified for protecting lives. Certain measures such as restrictions on democratic activities and silencing of critical voices of course remain undesirable. As the previous speakers have also mentioned it's community participation must be supported and encouraged in responding to not just the health crisis but also for other policy issues i will return to this in a moment so various political scientists have pointed out how the performance of any state in dealing with health and other crises seem to depend largely on two key factors the first is state capacity uh, very simply this is whether the state if there are enough people and resources to meet the urgent needs of the crisis the second thing is social trust which is that the state must be trusted by the people since their cooperation and collaboration is essential in effectively meeting the challenges posed by the crisis so question on a lot of people's mind uh, is are democracies better than authoritarian regimes at handling pandemics it's difficult to draw conclusions because of the dynamic nature of the crisis wherein the situation in any country might change drastically in a matter of days or weeks additionally the evaluation of responses is made difficult by the lack of any common reporting systems also the form of government is only one among several factors which determines the success or failure of a state's response in terms of democracies we've seen very different results in the cases of new zealand the uk and the united states so i think it might be more worthwhile to ask how is democracy transforming or evolving in the present scenario it's been noted that democracy was already in serious trouble before the pandemic only now the fault lines are conspicuously exposed we see disappointment with at the ineffectiveness of democracy liberal institutions of are you able to hear me I'm, i think there was some issue yes okay. yes we are able to hear you yes okay. sorry so there's a move towards a uh, conservative or an extreme are being dismantled and hollowed out to be sure these values include free flows of information government and officials being responsive to citizens needs citizens in turn trusting their government and a perception that government acts only in public interest 
in such a situation, states are able to use resources to reach deep and work with civil society, experts, and others to develop coordinated, effective responses. So in an article that I recently read in The Lancet, it showed how studies of previous health crises suggest that citizens are more likely to comply with health measures over the long term where they feel their voices are included in government decisions. Okay, so I know this paints a slightly grim picture, but there is of course another story as well. While COVID has triggered anti-democratic restrictions in some places, it has also incentivized innovative pro-democratic efforts and initi initiatives. Signs of stronger democratic resolve are evident in increasing civic activism despite rigid restrictions. So the real threat associated with COVID-19 emergency measures has spurred campaigns to monitor abuse of rights by governments during the health emergency. New civic practices and initiatives have allowed support being provided to the most vulnerable parts of society. Efforts aimed at complementing state capacity have been helping provide medical supplies or food as we've seen in India, as the support has come from NGOs, from private actors, celebrities, et cetera. And these programs help in assisting members of vulnerable local communities and running social support schemes. Most importantly, we also see a remarkable expansion of volunteerism as people have time to reflect on their situation in the bigger picture. I know this paints a slightly idealistic picture and there are of course various challenges in, in, a, broad, um, in, in a broad reach for such, for such uh, initiatives and measures. So in, this, in the context of the challenges and the opportunities pointed out, what role can technology play in safeguarding democracy and improving governance? I think the most obvious role technology can play is in providing access to information, which in the context of a pandemic ensures government cover-ups don't cost lives. Importantly, in democracies, people can vote against governments that perform badly in the crisis. The hope and the assumption in, in a perfect scenario is that electoral accountability should give leaders good incentive to enact good policies. However, this entire expectation is defeated when information is made unavailable. So must we emphasize that it's essential that governments remain committed to democratic values, practices, and processes in a meaningful manner by being open and easing access to data. So turning, turning our focus to India in particular, and speaking on technology, I, it seems that over time, internet communication technology holds the potential of becoming a great equalizer in a diverse, unequal, and developing country like ours. As we have noticed, steadily improving infrastructure and increasing smartphone ownership, though of course this remains limited in terms of the penetration into the rural heartland, is improving communication and access to information. We also see the increasing spread of economic and social benefits as technology facilitates payment transactions, easy remittances across the country, and giving access to larger markets for sellers. Of course, again, it is, it is still not complete because of the uneven access to such technology. Um, service delivery mechanisms for state support have also been facilitated through technology. So in this context, it seems that you know, business and other sites having been covered, governance is poised to be perhaps the next great space of tech-based innovation which is already underway to some extent. So at this point, I want to discuss an interesting case, which is that of Estonia. And Estonia is several years down the road if we embark on an effort to move governance service delivery mechanisms online. It is of course also important to keep in mind that Estonia is a very small country with a largely homogenous population, which makes it easier to create and implement such systems. I'm quite aware of what kind of difficulties and challenges would be faced in a country like ours, it is they created online systems, provided a unique digital identification. And I know some people may think of the Aadhaar um, initiative as something akin to this, but it's, it's important to note how data protection and safeguarding data of, the data of citizens was key to the design of the structure from the get-go. And because of such safety measures being implemented, they were able to move certain key services online, for, 
for instance, filing of their taxes, they began I voting all the way back in 2005. At this point, 99% of all public services in Estonia are available online. It would take you just about five minutes to file your taxes. And one third of citizens exercise the facility of voting online. Of course, traditional uh, in-person voting still continues. And more importantly, in the context of the pandemic that we're in, you also see that healthcare data is consolidated online. The entire history of patients, what kind of procedures they've had, what kind of medication, et cetera, they've received is safely stored online. The citizens themselves are the owners of this data and any access made by any state service to such data is immediately notified to the citizen. So Estonia is not alone as other countries are also attempting to incorporate innovations with support and help democratic institutions regain legitimacy. New type of democratic processes are emerging. For instance, we see digital debates as a large number of democratic forums have sprung up. There is an attempt to link citizens into the decision-making process through the use of social media and other tools. We also see a, an attempt to implement digital voting as many countries are looking at how to extend online voting for public and parliamentary institutions, while of course addressing the important digital vulnerabilities in order to make these practices more fully secure. Other notable emergent innovations in democratic participation include online protests. Um, I think all of us would remember the spamming of the account or the Minister for Environment uh, in response to the environment impact uh, assessment notification and the public consultation that happened. I think Fridays for Future spearheaded this and we saw what resistance they were met with. Um, we also see parliamentary digitization. So the UK most notably broke with 700 years of tradition during the pandemic and had a hybrid sitting of the parliament where the bulk of the house joined via Zoom conference because of medical, because of health related considerations during the pandemic. We also see steps to improve accountability, mechanisms for oversight of elections and democratic institutions. So what I'm trying to get at here is that technology can create new access points to deal with specific policy challenges that require deeper change. This, however, must be approached in a manner that counters resistance to change from different quarters by being as inclusive and most importantly, accessible to all. Because the worst thing that you can do is, is to perpetuate um, inequality through the digital divide, which exists in not just India, but in, in many other countries in the developing world. Also in terms of a concrete example of how um, democratic practices have adapted to the changed circumstance currently, we see that presently there are restrictions on physical movement and limitations to gathering for instance, demonstrations against questionable laws, et cetera. So we see how, uh, for instance, the, the resistance to the EIA was met by civil society organizations and initiatives um, online. Now, even as Dr. Nassima Reddy pointed out, it is, it, it is not fully representative at this stage because of um, problems of access but at least there is a movement in the direction of exploring such avenues. So at that point, it's, um, I'd also like to just point out an interesting thought that came to mind in this context, which is regarding resistance to change. And, and I want to frame this in a feasibility versus willingness um, debate. So in terms of resistance to change, and that means adapting to new technologies also. It's quite, it's, it's commonsensical that this primarily flows from those who benefit from the status quo. With the pandemic, you see an important disruptive event and such disruptions often lead to loosening of existing values and systems insofar as they are incompatible with the change circumstance. So to give an illustration, um, we can look at the judiciary. For many years, there has been a all for moving hearings online in order to ease access to the judicial system, especially for people in remote corners, and also to ease and facilitate access to justice. So the resistance that comes to this has 
primarily taken in the form of arguments on, on the grounds of impossibility or, or, or feasibility. However, when physical hearings were made impossible during the pandemic, the adoption of new technology became the only way forward. So the tools for online hearings were developed and implemented, though it's happened in a limited fashion and you see the Supreme Court and various high courts adopting this technology, it'll still take time for it to be um, implemented across the board, even to the lower judiciary, et cetera. So <clears throat> what we see here is that what was discussed in, in, in the vein of a feasibility problem is actually a, a willingness problem to some extent. There, of course, are feasibility concerns as well. But once such changes um, are initiated, they set important precedents, which at the very least, at least challenge resistance on the previous grounds of feasibility and impossibility. So again, while such innovations are promising and likely to help revive certain institutions, the primary challenges in a country like India with its diverse population, uneven distribution of resources and access to technological infrastructure will require a concerted effort on the part of the government, but also on the part of civil society in order to become effective. So a duty must be placed on both the state and civil society actors to ensure meaningful access is provided to all by ensuring the development of infrastructure, provision of access to resources, and ensuring necessary training and education is provided to utilize services, which can be then accessed by all. And another very important thing, which, which, um, which Dr. Nassim Reddy also pointed out before is, is regarding privacy and confidentiality. These are integral to the system and must be incorporated in the system design from its inception. We currently do not have a strong and robust data protection regulatory framework. And in the absence of such a framework, e-government is unthinkable because of the risk of misuse of sensitive data. And with that, I want to shift the discussion towards public trust, which I'd mentioned as one of the key factors determining the performance of various regimes in responding to not just health crisis, but other complex policy challenges. So I want to discuss a possible case for using technological innovation to mend some of the damage sustained by an institution which earlier enjoyed a great deal of public trust. And I'll, I'll use the case of the election commission. So in the past year, it was noted how the election commission, it, some of its legitimacy, legitimacy seemed diminished when it was in, unable or unwilling to pull up the ruling party for violations of the model code of conduct. Now, in November of this year, we know that the Bihar elections will be coming up and this will be the first state to go to the polls amidst the pandemic. The EC has already released guidelines, effectively ruling out postponement, and they have made certain provisions for um, concerns regarding the, the healthcare crisis. For instance, the last hour of polling for those tested with high fevers or symptoms of the virus. We've also seen an adoption of um, of new technology. So we see campaigning, campaigning has been happening virtually. Preparatory meetings and consultations between the election commission and state administration have also moved online. Now it remains to be seen if going forward with an in-person election is a good or a bad decision. If it turns out to be bad, a possible future innovation to prevent a repetition of such an issue would involve attempting to take elections online. Now in a country like ours, again, there are a lot of problems with doing that and you cannot make it mandatory. But if the option and systems are explored, perhaps at least it will set in place a system that can be developed and made accessible to all. We know it's possible. As I mentioned, we have the example of Estonia and such a move would require willingness on the part of the government to ensure meaningful access to such resources. And, and provide these to all citizens. So the technological gap does not perpetuate an access gap for citizens exercising their democratic rights. So at this point, I'll move to concluding and I just want to point a few, um, point out a few things that I think would help light a, way, a possible way forward. So there appears to be a need for systematic support for the new democratic civic activism that the pandemic has sparked. 
there must be an effort to develop emergent innovations in democratic participation, electoral practices, political party organization, and institutional oversight. Trust within communities and towards governments is a key feature that strengthen, strengthens effective public policies. While it's not unique to democracy, such trust can be more easily fostered through bottom-up inclusion and pluralism. So community participation remains key, and it matters because unpopular measures risk low compliance. Community input can help include voices of marginalized and vulnerable groups and identify solutions. They know what knowledge is circulating, can provide insights into stigma and structural barriers, and are well placed in the community to devise collective responses. Mechanisms to ensure citizen participation are essential for high quality, inclusive disaster response and preparedness. And these can be called upon in future emergencies as well. Also finally, such institutions create scripts and pathways that can be adapted to decision-making in other contexts and be utilized for dealing with complex policy issues, which require a collaborative and coordinated response. For instance, perhaps in tackling environmental degradation. So to ensure democratic governance in the pandemic and post pandemic circumstances, countries will need to develop innovative approaches for holding elections, take steps to enable the effective functioning of democratic institutions, improve parliamentary oversight of the executive, and most importantly, increase citizens' participation in the political process. The positive role of technology in spreading quick and in-depth information, disseminating preventive messages, and increasing public access to healthcare services has already been noted. Through the use of various apps and tools, it enables community participation in the collective response to the disease. From compliance to lockdown to deciding and implementing steps to be taken to ease restrictions, to community support through volunteering. All of these are made much easier now in comparison to past times, where the spread of communication was much slower than that of the disease itself. So with that, I'd like to thank um, the, organizers, the organizers and Professor Lakshmanan for, for the introduction and, and uh, to all the other speakers for their views. And I look forward to hearing from the others. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Harsh. A very, very nice uh, you know, uh, input. Uh, you have very rightly pointed out the, the context of e-governance in a, in a thriving democracy like India. And you have very uh, rightly associated this with uh, you know, several aspects, including the, the Bihar elections, how we are going to test, uh, you know, see the, uh, the, the thing happening there. I'm really wondering that, you know, is it the time that, uh, because this is a pandemic time, uh, uh, going uh, you know, in large number to the, the voting booths will definitely be a biggest uh, concern for all of us. Is it the right time to think about technology, you know, electronic voting rights, electronic voting, will it be possible? So I think, you know, we need to innovate, uh, uh, you know, in this context also. Being a largest democracy in the, in the world, India has major responsibilities in innovating uh, the democratic systems. And you have also I, one point, very important point that I uh, liked here in the context is the, the developing the trust in the democracy. And that's really a crux of uh, the democracy. So why we need to stick to democracy is that uh, we trust that. And how we are able to perpetuate that, how we are able to give that, uh, you know, uh, to the, you know, connecting the larger masses that uh, all the, the community interests are, you know, really taken care of so that the trust prevails in a democratic governance. So I think, you know, this is the, uh, you know, really uh, very important point in the contribution that you have made. Thank you very much, Harsh, for, uh, you know, your valuable time and uh, insights. I would like to, uh, you know, uh, now uh, welcome and invite uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, no, Mr. Sri uh, Dilip Reddy Garu. Uh, Sri Dilip Reddy, uh, you know, is coming from information background. You know, one of the, the, the main pillars of democracy is information. Information, without information, public participation doesn't happen. And without public participation, democracy doesn't work. 
and information is the basic pillar on which uh, the whole democracy is built and uh, here is an expert uh, who has worked on information whole of his life uh, mr uh, you know dilip reddy has served as information uh, you know uh, commissioner state information commissioner in the andhra pradesh information commission uh, and uh, you know he has extensively uh, uh, traveled as well as you know addressed more than 1300 meetings on uh, right to information act spreading the importance of right to information how people can exercise their rights under the rti act as a commissioner of right to information he has delivered several judgments on transparency information service matters quasi judicial issues and administration so several things he has already done he has several you know uh, achievements in his uh, career one is that he is also a journalist and uh, it is uh, you know he spread uh, information as a journalist and he was associated with enadu and he has worked in different places in hyderabad in delhi bureau and different uh, you know other uh, areas uh, working on different aspects of uh, uh, you know the information uh, giving to the people to uh, through enadu right now he is also you know uh, editor executive editor of uh, sakshi telugu daily and now through this he is spreading the information i think you know we are very fortunate to have you here sir and he is uh, the principal of uh, sakshi school of journalism teaching the next generation you know how they should uh, you know spearhead uh, the information movement he is a managing editor of uh, he was the managing editor of uh, sakshi uh, tv uh, he is also president of uh, the founder president of uh, greens alliance for conservation of eastern guards his contribution in the environmental field is also immense so i welcome um uh, shri dilip reddy sir for uh, you know sharing his uh, views thank you sir yes sir. thank you very much and uh, uh, good afternoon uh, all of you uh, the dignitaries who are uh, taking part in this uh, deliberation uh, <clears throat> as i was uh, talking to pavan in the morning uh, while communicating to pushpa kumar ji uh, what should be your topic he was asking me then i said after uh, uh, hearing both uh, uh dr narsimari diaru and uh, harsh baidi uh, i think that uh, the role of media in strengthening the democracy uh, is definitely a cause of concern uh, right taking from the inspiration from a beginning uh, speaker uh, professor purushottam reddy garu the historic uh, evolution of the democracy uh, the role of media also right from the beginning uh, working as a device uh, linking between the rulers and whom they are ruling uh, it a pivotal role has been played uh, by the media but uh, over a period of time uh, now especially in the context of covid we are discussing that media uh, is in a uh, crossroads today we can uh, touch upon a few few areas i would like to uh, Uh, mention here uh, i don't think it will be out of context that uh, today the media is uh, exactly in the crossroads uh, uh, for its survival question uh, by the by uh, innovation of technology and how technology uh, is coming into this area is not a, a big matter but the perceptions and the usage and uh, the how this tool has been used by uh, the time being the rulers as well as Uh, the corporate as well as the proprietary of the media is also very important uh, uh, to discuss uh, in the recent times united nations general secretary also mentioning that uh, in the light of uh, pandemic uh, the media role becoming very challenging uh, to play uh, in disseminating right information and making uh, people uh, strength to take participate in the uh, democratic uh, processes and uh, getting their uh, benefit which has been guaranteed by uh, the concerned democratic governments and as well as the uh, constitution of the concerned nations uh, in this uh, light even before the pandemic uh, if we take the indian context the uh, situation in this country uh, was uh, frustration was rising uh, and the trust in public institutions are declining uh, and the <clears throat> Uh, the 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 inequality of opportunities is leading to the uh, economic uh, crisis 
uh, and uh, unease of uh, economics and as well as the social unrest was prevailing. Uh, today it is uh, clear that uh, most to do, the listen people uh, uh, to uh, continue the democratic practices and uh, delivering what uh, they are supposed to get uh, is uh, slowly uh, shading up. Uh, especially in the pandemic time, uh, we are clearly, uh, it is highlighted, the pandemic itself highlighted certain areas like uh, our inadequacy of uh, uh, what you call the health systems, uh, as well as the uh, social uh, protection gaps, and uh, <clears throat> even uh, education system, uh, technological, as uh, Betty rightly mentioned, that uh, new uh, devices and innovations are coming in the uh, uh, information education systems uh, and even the uh, judicial process, but uh, but the opportunities are uh, very much unequal in this uh, society. Uh, that will definitely hamper the interest of the people uh, at the downtrodden and the voiceless people will definitely suffer. Uh, to fill the gaps, uh, the media has to play tremendous role uh, in this particular area where the uh, it should become the voice of voiceless people. Uh, that's, that is the main important uh, role of media uh, has supposed to play. Uh, but uh, even before uh, <clears throat> this pandemic, uh, the media over a period of time, if we go back to the history, uh, pre-independent era and the initial days of the post-independent, uh, the media was uh, playing a tremendous role and the great uh, contribution by the media has been appreciated by uh, everyone and it become a tremendous tool uh, in many institutions and uh, uh, public uh, organizations and civil society uh, in order to uh, doing their fight for the achieving independence uh, and to <clears throat> Uh, get uh, uh, fruitful uh, uh, results and outcomes from the governments. Media played a catalytic role uh, by enhancing their power of participating in deliberation uh, and uh, by providing right information and uh, uh, acting as uh, a beautiful uh, device between uh, government and the public and what public uh, expectations are from the government and what government is planning and designing for the well-being of uh, citizen because Ours is the citizen-centric uh, democracy. Uh, in any citizen-centric uh, democracy, it will become pertinent duty of the governments to uh, plan certain programs uh, in the larger interest of society and implement with uh, certain uh, social obligations on them uh, for achieving the equality and equal opportunities providing to the citizens. While acting like that, our governments are uh, uh, properly uh, exploring the democratic process or not, uh, this will become the prime duty of media uh, to expose uh, uh, timely uh, and uh, um, uh, alerting people uh, for uh, uh, continuing their fight against the government to get their benefits, which is supposed to get. But uh, in this uh, particular context, I would like to remind many, many, many such aspects uh, where uh, media failed to deliver uh, its, uh, mm, uh, to discharge its uh, uh, proper duties. Uh, for that, uh, there are many reasons. Uh, we can see, uh, first of all, the institutions were uh, uh, <clears throat> made weak uh, over a period of time. Uh, and uh, the concerned governments uh, uh, not uh, giving a good opportunity for them for uh, uh, properly utilizing their uh, freedom of uh, speech and expression. That uh, freedom of speech and uh, expression is the fundamental right which has been guaranteed by the, our constitution, uh, faces several uh, times uh, hardship from the uh, consecutive governments in this country. Uh, not only here in this country, in, uh, in many countries, even if we take this uh, pandemic, in the initial of uh, this pandemic, many countries uh, announcing uh, emergencies, they curtailed the democratic processes and uh, reduced the avenues uh, that uh, ultimately led to the weakening of uh, uh, roots of the uh, democratic uh, practices and democratic uh, institutions in certain countries. In the e e even in the Indian context, uh, for example, if we take that uh, uh, announcement of lockdown by the government. Uh, even without uh, thinking about uh, 
nearly 8 to 10 crores of uh, uh, migrated labor. Uh, simply, they announced uh, that lockdown, uh, not applying mind about uh, they, their day-to-day uh, uh, -day earnings, and uh, uh, but their live their uh, livelihood uh, and their stay. Such all uh, things were not considered. Uh, uh, without considering and they simply announced. Even uh, judiciary was not uh, uh, on-time uh, rescue uh, of their issues. Uh, in the July, in the midst of July once, uh, when the uh, case came uh, in front of Supreme Court, Supreme Court said that we are not going to believe the uh, private survey outcomes when the government is uh, 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 telling that they are taking every care of the migrant labors. Uh, and, and, and in the later part of July also, the same thing Supreme Court re reiterated uh, without uh, coming for the rescue of uh, migrant labors. But ultimately, in the end, after uh, flowing a uh, lot of water beneath the bridge and many people died uh, and a um, uh, lot of uh, adverse consequences uh, faced by that poor uh, 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 community of uh, migrant labor, uh, Supreme Court uh, clearly said that, no, no, it is the duty of the government with uh, government expenditure and uh, travel expenses by the by providing uh, food and with the honor they must be uh, taken to their uh, native places. This was the judgment delivered by the Supreme Court. But what happened to the previous two occasions? That was not uh, properly exposed by the uh, media repeatedly. Uh, this sort of uh, happenings taking place in the uh, media. Media, uh, over a period of time, corporatization of media, uh, it, it, it's slowly coming out of its primary and fundamental uh, duties of uh, informing, educating, uh, entertaining, and motivating the people is the prime uh, concern and cause of the uh, media it uh, should but. But over a period of time, uh, as uh, Noam Chomsky rightly mentioned a few decades back, he said that manufactured consent and later uh, uh, even manufactured dissent uh, become the fashion of media. Uh, uh, apart from the service it is rendering, uh, sometimes it is uh, doing a lot of uh, adverse cause, adverse impact for the better practices of uh, democracy and uh, the fruitful. Uh, uh, distribution of uh, uh, avenue, uh, distribution of opportunities uh, and providing opportunities to the uh, different section of society, especially uh, those uh, who are neglected uh, uh, sections of the society. For their sake, media has to stand. Uh, but incidentally, uh, media was uh, uh, not adequately done in the period of uh, a pandemic. Especially, uh, media would have been done uh, by taking classic uh, case, cases and uh, classic uh, examples of uh, how the uh, inadequacy of uh, medical and uh, when uh, government announced lockdown and uh, before uh, uh, withdrawal, what sort of measures has been taken by the government uh, for equipping uh, their hospitals, for equipping uh, their uh, system of uh, health services. Uh, that area was totally neglected and uh, totally the government uh, simply depended on the sacrifices of uh, 130 crores uh, people uh, by facing a lot of hardship who sacrificed uh, uh, their everything uh, during the lockdown. Uh, but uh, governments uh, not uh, taken adequate uh, measures that was not adequately focused by the media. Uh, media should act uh, as a... <clears throat> A device to alert uh, both the public side to build up uh, social movements uh, and the other side governments uh, to stand on their toes to deliver uh, what they supposed to do for the well-being of the people by strictly adhering to the provisions of the law by the by strictly adhering to the spirit of the constitution that has been failed during this six months of period uh, that should have been focused properly by the media media uh, because of uh, a lot of uh, reasons and uh, factors over a period of time, its impact has been gone down uh, due to various reasons uh, for their uh, interest, disinterest, sometimes vested interest. Uh, the proprietary uh, interest and disinterest is also uh, playing a big and vital role uh, in uh, determining the content which they are delivering into the public domain. Uh, this must be questioned by the 
civil society properly and uh, public institutions. Uh, one more important thing, uh, the, the uh, duty of uh, media will give optimum results when uh, the, all of the supporting institutions of democracy are functioning in true spirits. Then only uh, the effort of media will give optimum result. Uh, for example, you see today, uh, there is uh, no uh, human right functioning uh, and no uh, right to information in institutions are working properly. Uh, over a period of time, these governments, whether state governments or uh, government of India, uh, diluted uh, the concept framed behind uh, uh, bringing right to information act and uh, putting the information into the public uh, domain and uh, giving access to the people. People can question the governments. Even in the pandemic time, uh, people uh, must be on a pedestal where they can question the governments. Uh, what is uh, your uh, provisions you are providing? Uh, what is the uh, equipment uh, you are having in the government in institutions where I can come and get uh, medical uh, facility? But uh, you are compelling me to go to the private institutions where private hospitals are charging lots of rupees uh, for the COVID uh, treatment. Uh, in this context, uh, people can access uh, information and can be in a position to question the government. Question today, question has been curbed and uh, uh, crushed like anything by the constant government. Uh, this is uh, working uh, totally against the uh, democracy as well as the spirit of the democracy, uh, where media has to expose that and uh, non giving access to the information and non maintaining the information properly and um, uh, slowly and uh, systematically uh, uh, diluting. Uh, uh, the institutions like uh, uh, right to information, uh, information commissions, as well as uh, this uh, CBI, like investigation, investigating agencies like CBI and uh, <clears throat> Vigilance Commission, uh, Human Rights Commission. Uh, like that, many institutions uh, uh, over a period of time uh, diluted by the constant governments, which uh, uh, is causing uh, uh, the uh, media role uh, a critical um, media, even if media wants to uh, uh, highlight certain aspects of those institution outcome, uh, will definitely become the counterproductive if those institutions are not uh, running with the spirit and just becoming uh, uh, simple tools in the hands of the rulers, uh, the results will definitely uh, counterproductive if media exaggerate or media focus certain issues. Instead, media uh, should play a neutral role uh, to expose certain institutions and inhibitions and uh, incapabilities of certain institutions because of dilution made by the governments itself. That is uh, a big factor. Media has to take that uh, realistic role uh, in, the, in the society today. Now, the uh, social media proliferation, uh, making uh, the conventional media to stand on its uh, toes uh, because uh, the fake news coming into the public domain uh, for ser serving and subserving the purpose of the political ill-intended uh, rulers uh, who wants to get their works done uh, without the right information into the public domain. Uh, for that cause, that fake information is uh, becoming a danger phenomena uh, for, for proper countering that fake information and disseminating the right information by uh, doing its uh, regular inv investigative uh, work and legwork, uh, the conventional media has to take uh, a, a catalytic role and it has to play. It has uh, by going into the field by getting uh, information, uh, it has to uh, serve with the, with the right information and the people will be uh, on their uh, right uh, platform to fight against the wrong deeds by the governments to get their benefit, which has been uh, assured and uh, guaranteed by the constitution. And this, uh, I can't uh, take much examples, but I can quote certain things where priorities of media is changing because uh, as per the uh, situation, certain aspects, but most of the times it is uh, interest of the corporates by the by, interest of the proprietary of the media. Uh, otherwise you see today, 
the economic condition prevailing economic conditions of the country and the priorities of the government and the inequalities and unequal opportunities of the different sections of society uh, in the pandemic like education like health and like just now my previous uh, speakers was rightly mentioning that uh, not uh, going for the physical uh, judi judicial practice of courts and uh, going for the online uh, uh, e system of uh, uh, judicial practices are hampered the interests of the people who do not have the right access to the technology by the by the devices such all people are suffering a lot in certain aspects not taking those all the issues as the priority issues for the media today media is taking issue of the sushant uh, uh, rawat and uh, this um, uh, rangana kangana ranaut and uh, even in the state uh, one suicide of a, a tv serial artist these are the becoming main issues by the media uh, by keeping the great important issues with having a much impact and the larger impact of uh, cross section of people uh, is going down to the lower uh, priorities and the inner side inside pages and the most non priority issues coming uh, to focus because of uh, 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 their uh, <clears throat> their wrong priorities and and also media has to Uh, think that uh, now they are uh, really facing a crisis of uh, question of survival also uh, the pandemic really shown the, that uh, reduced uh, advertisement space by the by not getting the uh, government advertisements by the by the corporate advertisements even from the market they are not getting at the same time circulation also uh, for print media it is becoming very challenging task to survive uh, the people habits also changing uh, they are now shifting towards to the uh, electronic uh, mode and uh, uh, online uh, uh, e pages they are preferring rather than the physical copies uh, that is also print media slowly uh, losing its uh, glory uh, to get back its uh, glory uh, it has to be a uh, positive uh, with uh, with with showing much interest for the protection of people interest and uh, Uh, in, in order to strengthen the democracy, uh, media should focus that uh, uh, to extend its uh, uh, critical uh, and uh, catalytic role for strengthening of uh, different uh, institutions, which will strengthen uh, in overall democracy. That uh, institutional strengthening, which is the uh, 16th point of sustainable development uh, goals envisaged by the United Nations, uh, media should concentrate. Uh, on strengthening uh, the uh, public institutions democratic institutions uh, in order to achieve the overall strengthening of uh, democracy that is that should become the order of the day and its priorities must be changed and people centric uh, democracy only strengthen if uh, the uh, institutions like uh, media uh, should think in the larger interest of the people and the people centric uh, approach they must adapt technology will definitely support them but technology is only an instrument in their hands but their perception uh, their intentions uh, their overall uh, 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 goal uh, is very important uh, that if goes in on for with the uh, democracy is concerned uh, to strengthen the democratic institutions i hope that uh, media uh, will uh, definitely catch uh, a right path from the crossroads and it will definitely get back its glory which it was enjoying uh, decades together even before the independence and post independent early decades what uh, media was enjoying reputation i think in the present day uh, by using the new innovative and uh, technological institutes instruments they will definitely get back that glory uh, this hope uh, i would like to conclude here uh, thank you for providing me this opportunity thank you one and all thank you very much sir yeah wonderful you know you have really raised the very important points relating to the the participation of media in uh, promoting uh, the democracy and the democratic values in the country it's very important thank you very much and now you know we are uh, very happy to welcome dr manaka guru swami uh, dr manaka guru swami is a, a senior advocate at the supreme court of india and she is a very prominent voice in the supreme court in that uh, you know i'm very happy to welcome her Uh, she is a B.R. Ambedkar Research Scholar and lecturer at uh, Columbia Law School, New York. 
and she has been a visiting faculty at Le Yale Law School, uh, then uh, New York uh, University School of Law, University of Toronto Faculty of Law, and she has assist assisted the, the Supreme Court in many cases. And uh, she has also defended the parties uh, in the cases uh, like uh, the Section 377 case, bureaucratic reforms case, right to information case. And she is an amicus curiae in many cases like uh, uh, the, the present one uh, pertaining to the alleged extrajudicial killing of more than you know, 1,500 people in Manipur. And her uh, uh, you know, your service has been recognized worldwide and her advice has been taken by the UN uh, Development Fund, UNICEF, and she has been helping different countries like Sudan uh, and Nepal. Particularly in Nepal, she has supported the constitution making process. And uh, she has also helped the UNICEF uh, South Sudan uh, on the aspects of international human rights law. And she has been really recognized and prized in different forum. Uh, particularly, she is, uh, you know, we need to take pride in, uh, you know, recognizing this, that she is the first Indian and the second woman to have her portrait hung at the, the Milner Hall uh, in uh, Rhodes House in the University of uh, Oxford. And she has been uh, featured in uh, the foreign policies, 100 global thinkers list, Time Magazine's 100 most influential people. And uh, she has also been featured in Forbes India's uh, list of women, Power Trailblazer in 2019. I'm very happy to welcome you here. And uh, uh, for your benefit, I would like to just tell that, you know, we have been discussing on this, uh, you know, the, the International Day of Democracy, various aspects of, uh, you know, democracy, the facets, uh, how the challenges we are facing in the country and around the world. Uh, and uh, Professor uh, Purushottam Reddy sir has, uh, you know, given a, uh, a historic overview of uh, the democracy through the ages. And uh, uh, he has introduced the book, uh, the, uh, the, ten, day, the uh, 10 Ideologies uh, written by uh, late uh, Mr. Jaipal Reddy. And uh, he has uh, highlighted the, the, the views of uh, Mr. Jaipal Reddy in his talk. And we have been you know, discussing the, the, threat, the threats which are happening here in the country uh, with regard to uh, democracy and how the, the technology and the media can play a role in defending and promoting democratic values in the country. So this is where we have landed now. And now we are going to hear from you. How, uh, you know, what are the issues relating to Dr. the- Dr. Lakshmanan. Over to Dr. you. Dr. Lakshmanan. Yes, sir, please. Uh, Dr. Balakrishnan uh, wanted, uh, you know, he has some classes. Can you check with him if he wants to go first? I mean, uh, he had this uh, 12 to 12.30 slot. Okay, so Dr. Manaka, uh, uh, how is your convenience? You are coming I, from court? Yeah, I'm actually between cases in court. Uh, uh -huh. I need just 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, so if that's okay, I'll, I'll finish in about 10 minutes and then uh, the next person can proceed. But I'm actually between cases. That's why I had asked for this time. Wonderful. I think, you know, if it is uh, agreeable to uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Balakrishnan. Uh, Professor Balakrishnan, are you here? Will it be fine? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is whoever intervened on beha my behalf. I think uh, uh, Ms. Guruswami must go ahead. Uh, that's just fine. I'll wait. Thank you so much. And there's no need to cut your presentation short. I can wait. Thank you so much. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, for that, Thank you. Um, Professor. Um, you know, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I, you know, I have, Jaipal Reddy has, has been a dear friend of my family's for decades. Um, my father and he went to college together and, and really um, I've known him from the time I've been a child. So I've known him all my life. Um, I think it's important to recognize, you know, that we celebrate um, his life uh, and his memory, not simply because he's a five-term, you know, Lok Sabha MP or a twice over union minister, um, but because through his life and his work and his career as a, as a politician, he was one of the few politicians who in fact epitomized uh, many constitutional values, including his commitment to equality, dignity, secularism, um, and, and distribute of justice. Um, so um, I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, I think about Jaipal Reddy, the veteran journalist Nirja Chaudhary had said, uh, quote, that Jaipal Reddy is going as a poignant reminder that the India we knew and wrote about is not there anymore. 
And I think in many ways, um, his life and the fact that he's not here anymore um, must compel us to reflect um, on this moment in India's uh, democratic and constitutional trajectory when so much is at stake and what is on the rise uh, is division, uh, is violence, and what is on the decline um, is old fashioned constitutional values like speech, a free press. Um, and, you know, to sort of piggyback on what the previous speaker was, he was talking about his discontent with the press. Uh, we are at a moment where the press has gone from reporting to becoming a wing of propaganda. And that is really a dramatic transformation of a very key institution, um, not just in India, but all over the world. So I'd like to talk about two things today. Um, uh, and I think you'll find this a unifying theme, I suspect, amongst your previous presentations also. Um, I'd like to talk about India's uh, constitutional democracy, a few values. And I'd like to connect that to the decline of those values, including the role um, that institutions like the press play in that. Um, because I think that we are uh, witnessing historic times where we're seeing the decline of um, the press, which is not just a watchdog, but is also supposed to be a nation storyteller. And so when the values of that storyteller change, then they, you must pause and ask why that's happened. So firstly, I'd like to talk about as a lawyer, very, very basic ideas in this country, right? The founders of this country didn't, didn't only envisage India as a democratic nation. They envisaged it as a constitutional democracy. What does that mean, right? It means that we committed to very core constitutional values of socialism, secularism, justice, liberty, equality. And we committed to equalizing opportunities. Um, when the constitution was adopted, this was the first time that Indian society actually committed to values of equality, non-discrimination on grounds of religion or caste or race or sex or place of birth. And we also committed to a very radical idea, uh, which we first tried out in India, that of making reparations through reservation um, for historical discrimination on grounds of caste. Now, this was in fact a break. The constitution broke from endemic inequality, entrenched discrimination that was present all through Indian society across eras, right? Uh, whether it's the British era, whether it's the Mughal era, whether it's pre-Mughal eras. Uh, and this was the founder's formula. This was the Indian founder's formula to keeping this nation together and for all to prosper. But what we are seeing at this moment today, and this is not just true only to India, but for all over the world, we are seeing the rise of authoritarianism and we're seeing the decline of dissent. We're seeing the decline of an oppositional politics and we're seeing the decline of a free press. And this we're seeing all over the world, whether it's the United States, whether it's Hungary, whether it's India, whether it's Eastern Europe, whether it's Turkey, all across the world. Now, what is fueling this, right? We are all perturbed by what is fueling the decline of free speech, free press, dissent, and political opposition, which in any democracy, you need a ruling party and you need a strong opposition. Now, what is fueling this in terms of the press as a storyteller? So the big thing that has changed all over the world in the last under a decade is the rise of social media. That's the first big thing. And by social media, I mean platforms. Uh, many of us use them. You know the popular platforms. You know platforms that are available to disseminate news rapidly, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Facebook. And what is dramatically different between this kind of media and traditional media is that these are unmediated um, storytellers. There is no fact checker, there is no editor, there is no mediated source of asking for both sides of a story. This is my opinion against your opinion. You don't even need to step outside your home today to have an ill-informed opinion that you can post online and use that to make it go viral. This is the first thing that has changed globally and that has also changed in India. So where you had a, you know, a more conventional press, whether it's television press or whether it's print media, that were the big sources of news that were mediated by institutional checks internally, you don't have that today. Today you have a television news 
and you have social media, both of whom social media, it becomes an unmediated reporting source and television today has gone from reporting to becoming wings of propaganda. And these are your two biggest sources of news in what is predominantly a young country. And by that, I mean demographically, most Indians are below the age of 35 and most young people do not get their news from newspapers or from conventional, even news channels. They get their news from social media. And they get their news from internet news. They get their news from YouTube, Facebook, WhatsApp, TikTok, and that is their source of information and understanding. And while this is happening globally, what this has spawned is it has spawned a kind of vicious tribalism. And by tribalism, I mean that you are intertwining politics, resulting in division, and you're aligning it around, uh, uh, um, around core identities, right? Like race, like religion, like caste. So in India, you'll see this playing out with religion and caste and the use of both of those to stir division, especially religion. And in America, you'll see this playing out in the context of race. So if it's white majoritarianism in America, which is fueling division, it is a certain kind of majoritarian muscular Hindutva nationalism, which is fueling division in India. And both those movements are propelled by the use, very interesting use of social media. Technology enables social media to do away with having to put together a organized demonstration on the street, you can just inspire a rapid mob to come together momentarily through you know, posts and ideas going viral, right? Now, all of this writing, thinking, targeting that algorithms of social media companies do is unmediated by fact-checking or editors of any kind. And this has become the primary mode of news, especially not just for young people, but in times of a pandemic, when we're all cloistered in our homes, in our offices, where we're not interacting with people outside, this becomes our primary source of news, information, forming opinions, and agitation. And this has now become a way for political movements to use this to organize both for elections, but also very importantly, to determine what identities will dominate. And I think which identity dominates in India today is very clear. The last bit of this, of course, and more recently as a lawyer, I see with great concern is the use of the media to go from a moment, a constitutional value of fair trial to going to a value of trial by media. And that is not just about one industry or a actor or a, you know, uh, but that is something larger, right? Because the day you have a situation where it is media trials, which will run one, determine investigation, two, determine which agencies will investigate, and three, determine therefore the outcome of that investigation then the courtroom stops being a place that makes for a fair trial. The courtroom only becomes yet another actor in that you know, narrative, in that trajectory of propaganda. And that is actually what has happened today. Today, you are in a dangerous moment in India because you have a muscular majority for the ruling party in parliament. You have the decline of the press, the traditional press as we know, knew it, you have the growth, the mammoth growth of unmediated social media, and you also have the decline of organized oppositional politics. This is the moment that we are in in India today. So then you ask yourself, what are the consequences of this on the world's largest constitutional democracy and the world's largest democracy? And the consequences of this on the world's largest democracy is more division, is the lack of valid issue spotting. So the issues that are being spotted by our main storyteller, the media is not a declining economy by 23%. The issues that are being spotted is not migrant workers without work, without medical care. The issues that are not being spotted is not that India today is the unparalleled leader 
in COVID cases, both in terms of positivity as well as in terms of number of deaths. But the issue that is being spotted is whether marijuana was consumed by an actor or not. And that at many levels may seem comical, but actually it is diabolical when you think of it as part of the creation of national consciousness and as the part of creation of formed public opinion. So if the public's gaze in any democracy is not taken to the real issues that trouble that society, but, but become tangential and unimportant issues, then the media becomes a tool in covering for something else. So what is this media becoming a tool to cover for? And what are the consequences of that? The consequences of that, I suspect, if Jaipal Reddy was around, he would say, the consequences of it are ill-thought-out economic policies. The consequences of it is a lack of spotlight on the mismanagement of a global pandemic as it impacts our country. And the consequences of it are heightened division along fault lines of religion and caste and a vicious degradation of any kind of thoughts of dissent and political dissent, which are both very important in our country today. So really the consequences force us to ask the question that if you have this kind of decline and this kind of transformation of the, the press as objective storytellers to the press as wings of propaganda, then will this country survive as a constitutional democracy whose cardinal values were meant to be equality, non-discrimination, and secularism. And I'll stop there. Dr. Manaka, thank you very much for this, uh, you know, very wonderful and uh, you know, deep, insightful uh, thoughts. Uh, you have very much, you know, very rightly highlighted the dangers of the social media and the social media taking up the, the role of uh, the, the trial, uh, you know, the uh, forum. That's really killing us. And that is really, you know, once the public opinion is created, you know, that compels the, the judiciary also to go with the, uh, the, such a you know, public opinion. We have been seeing this in several cases, uh, uh, you know, all popular cases we have been seeing. I don't want to name the, the cases. So this is a very important concern that we have. And also the, the, the basic pillars of the, the Indian democracy are, you know, crumbling down. I think that, you know, we all have a, a joint, uh, you know, duty and the responsibility uh, to think about this, uh, where, you know, uh, seriously, and we need to, uh, you know, combine together our efforts uh, to uh, change the scenario so that, you know, we promote, uh, you know, good functional democracy, the constitutional and the, the parliamentary democracy that we have already committed with, and, uh, you know, and that works for the welfare of everyone. I think that will happen. Thank you very much for your, uh, you know, very important. Thank views. you for having me. Yes. Thanks for your nice time. Yes. Thank you. So we will move on to the next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Balakrishnan. And, uh, you know, Menaka, I know that, yes, she has left. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, you are busy with the, the, the court, uh, you know, cases are still, you know, you have, uh, you, know, share, you know, taken out your time and uh, joined us. Uh, well, thank you. You know, we are very thankful. Thank you for having me. Thanks, thank sir. you. Yeah. So now we are moving on to, you know, Professor Balakrishnan. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for joining us. You know, it is really a, a proud moment for us to have you here with us. Uh, I introduce uh, Professor Balakrishnan. Uh, professor uh, Pulapre Balakrishnan is, uh, you know, currently Professor of Economics at uh, Ashoka University, Haryana. He is a renowned economist and uh, educationist, and he has served in different capacities in, uh, you know, in various uh, reputed institutions. He was a director of uh, Center for Development Studies. Uh, and uh, uh, professor at uh, Indian Institute of uh, Management, uh, Cody Court. And uh, he has also held several appointments uh, uh, at uh, Worcester College, Oxford, uh, Indian Statistical Institute, Delhi, Indian Institute of Management, Cody Court. And uh, he also served at, uh, the as a country economist for Ukraine at World Bank and has been a consulted, uh, consultant to the, the ILO, International Labor Organization, and uh, UNDP, uh, and he was uh, the recipient of uh, the Malcolm Adishesh Award, very very renowned award for his distinguished contribution to the the development studies. Uh, he has uh, authored many books. Uh, I will just quote uh, you know three books. One is uh, the Pricing and Inflation in India, Economic Growth in India, 
politics trumps economics. And this one along with uh, 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 Mr. Bimal Jalan. So his contribution to economics and uh, education is uh, you know, recognized uh, worldwide. So I would like to request uh, Professor Balakrishnan to share his views on this day of uh, democracy. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pushpumar. And um, good afternoon to everybody present. I first want to thank um, the uh, three organizations which have uh, arranged this, the meeting, uh, the webinar rather, the Capital Foundation, the Jaipal Reddy Foundation, and the Council for Glo a Green Revolution. Uh, I, I don't know any of these organizations, so I consider it a particular privilege that they've chosen to ask me to speak. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I, I will be quite brief because uh, uh, I'm an economist and I can't really uh, claim to have a great deal of uh, understanding about uh, democracy, at least in its theoretical version. Uh, so I will tend to speak uh, largely about uh, one aspect of democracy in India, which I believe has probably been ignored a little bit, uh, which is uh, broadly the condition uh, of the population, in particular, the material condition of the population, partly because uh, that's really only what I'm competent to speak about, but partly also because I think it's extremely important and perhaps does not get as much importance as it should when we talk about democracy, at least in India. Now, uh, uh, I'm also thankful to the uh, organizers for having brought to my attention uh, the existence of uh, International Day of, Indi uh, of Democracy, which I'm, I'm sorry to say I wasn't even aware of, um, uh, declared so by the United Nations uh, on September 15th. Now, um, uh, an entry on the website of the UN states that uh, this um, occasion provides an opportunity to review the state of democracy in the world. So that, that I think is an extremely important thing to do and I can't help thinking that as a citizen of India, perhaps we should be moving on to uh, uh, have a day every year when we review the state of democracy in our country, uh, maybe uh, even more so than celebrating our independence from colonial rule, which of course is very important, but maybe by today we need to focus on uh, the state of democracy in our country, especially given the challenges which we are facing in an increasing form uh, uh, every day. Now, formally, India is a democracy, right? There is no contesting that. Uh, th we have multi-party elections with universal suffrage, sorry, suffrage, um, subject only to an age restriction. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, in evaluations of Indian democracy, uh, there are always, uh, 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 you know, statements about how it is the world's largest democracy, uh, partly uh, evidenced by the smooth transition of power every time a government changes, uh, that we do have civil liberties, at least on paper, we have a constitution, uh, civil liberties which can be, uh, which are justiceable in courts of law, uh, etc. Now, this is a valid, valid ob uh, observation, and I wouldn't take, uh, take away from that. I wouldn't want to take away from that. But I want to say that this is probably uh, only a partial assessment. Um, it's really in some ways akin to the fact of, or, or to rather admiring a building for its architecture rather than pausing to ask uh, or to inquire uh, how happy are the individuals or habit habitants of that building? I mean, how happy they are. Now, why is it important to, for us to recognize this? Uh, it's important for us to recognize this because when we look at uh, the formal democracies of the world, we recognize that they vary considerably uh, as far as uh, the uh, world happiness index or the happiness index of countries. And this uh, looks at about 150 countries and it's kind of interesting that uh, of the democracies of the world or the democracies of the world are arranged in different parts of the distribution. So, uh, even though it's on a perfect index, uh, it is based on actual responses from people. So it's based on people's perceptions 
of many aspects of the things that are, matter to them in terms of their life, but also in terms of what they believe is the governance that they receive, in particular, whether the governance that uh, in their country is sensitive to their needs. So I think this is a very important thing. And by and large, this seems to not figure at all, i.e. people's perceptions of democracy uh, uh, does not perceive, uh, does not uh, find a place in much of the evaluation or in most of the evaluations that we uh, see undertaken this, these days. But this was not the case uh, in the early days of the Republic. Uh, uh, um, two leaders of India who spoke a great deal about uh, uh, how in people felt about governance and society were uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan. I will focus a little bit here, uh, partly because of shortage of time, on only Nehru's viewpoint, which is expressed very, very clearly uh, in, in the, uh, his speech uh, to the Constituent Assembly on 15th August 1947. And what are among the things that he said? He, he thought of uh, the goal of uh, independence and democracy was to create institutions in India that would allow every man and woman to lead a fulfilling life. Now that's absolutely important. And, and uh, this seems to have not received any attention whatsoever uh, in our, uh, our evaluations of democracy in India. Now, um, the point here is that Nehru did not say government will build these institutions. He just said, said that is the goal of independence. And that's very important. He was obviously very closely aware of the fact that democracy is not statism, right? It's not, it's not something which really privileges the government in some way or the state in some way. Uh, so basically, he, he believed, I believe, uh, that people build institutions that matter to them. And this is not really a pipe dream. I want to give three examples, all of which historical examples, all of which took place in the United States in the 1960s, the late 1960s. Uh, you had a civil rights movements for black empowerment. You had a, a women's, uh, a feminist movement for uh, women's empowerment. And, and you had a, a, a sexual liberation movement, part of it, part of which was for the empowerment of hitherto sexual minorities. So all of the, and these movements are extremely potent in terms of their outcomes. It's also significant that these movements receive no support at all from the United States state or from the state in the United States. Uh, uh, so these institutions, uh, the institutions that came out of these movements were really built by individuals. Now, does this mean that the state has no role uh, in building these institutions? No, that's not correct. And this is very relevant for India. States can, um, can uh, be, um, uh, can, through legislation, especially states are very significant in removing laws uh, which constrain individual freedom, individual ad advancement. Uh, le let's think of uh, uh, situations where, uh, you know, women born into fairly comfortable families uh, have to face social sanction uh, against uh, inheritance. Uh, against uh, women's education. In all these situations, in, uh, the, the courts of law are very, very important. The state has a role. Now, however, the state also has a role in another field, which is actually takes us very close to where we are uh, today. Uh, and, and here I want to um, uh, use, if I may, um, the contribution of uh, the economist Amartya Sen uh, who spoke about uh, uh, the contribution that is made to our sense of fulfillment or uh, the, the allowing us to lead the life that we really value, the contribution that is made uh, uh, by what is referred to as capabilities. Now, there's no very definitive definition of capabilities, but it's largely believed that health and education are fundamentally important to that. Now, um, uh, uh, there's always the argument of self-help, which is part of the uh, whole ideology of self-empowerment, uh, which is very important. But it's also not very difficult to realize that actually uh, the state has a very important role in, in, in uh, creating these capabilities or endowing these individuals 
uh, with these capabilities. Uh, and uh, I refer in particular uh, to health and education, which are areas where individuals cannot um, really endow themselves. Think of once again uh, of uh, people born into poverty. They're not capable of finding the resources to educate themselves. Historically in India, the caste system uh, was a social system which excluded vast sections of the population from education. Once again, women may be born into wealth, but they may face social sanction uh, against women's education. These are all areas where the state has a fundamental role uh, in, 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 in contributing to uh, a, a advance, a social advance and social empowerment. Now, I spoke about the World Happiness uh, uh, Report and the Happiness Index, which is uh, uh, brought out by the United Nations. Let me very briefly also mention uh, an index which you're probably familiar with, which uh, uh, is a broad measure of, of the uh, degree of capability uh, 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 in the Indian population. I'm talking about the Human Development Index, uh, which is uh, brought out by the United uh, uh, Nations Development Program every year. In the most recent report, uh, India is ranked 129th out of 188 countries. Now, this is something, again, which is very, very uh, troubling. And we must really think about this as a, as a deep flaw in Indian democracy, which has been there for a great deal of time and, and precedes the assault on civil liberties, et cetera, which we see today. I want to be very brief and say that to, uh, to bring to the fore the uh, democratic deficits with respect to health and education in India uh, is not for a moment to underplay or lower the importance of other aspects of democracy, such as a free press, uh, uh, freedom of expression, uh, the recognition of uh, human rights and individual rights vis-a-vis -vis the state. These are all fundamentally important, but it is equally important to recognize that we as a people come together to form a democratic form of government, also to empower ourselves in every way so that we have the requisite capabilities to participate in our own governance. And health and education are fundamental to that. If you don't have health and education, it's completely in, uh, uh, unimportant. And I personally, uh, democracy becomes unimportant. And I just want to say that I personally disagree very strongly with the view uh, that to, to uh, recognize uh, that health and education must figure very strongly in any evaluation of uh, democracy, either the health and education of the population. Uh, 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 I disagree with the view that this is to view uh, uh, democracy as purely instrumental. Uh, and democracy is really an end in itself. I don't think that's correct. Democracy is also, democracy also has goals. And one of those goals is to empower people to participate once again in their own governance. Now, uh, you might think, uh, or rather I'm aware that I may have spoken in slightly abstract terms, so let me come right away to where we are today. Uh, we are uh, in, the, uh, in the throes of an unprecedented uh, uh, critical moment in, in our lives in India were caused by the COVID-19 um, pandemic and also uh, uh, contributed to very strongly by a highly inadequate response from the part of government. Uh, uh, in, in this, of course, the central government uh, has a major role, but I, I, I would, as one of the earlier speakers mentioned, also give a major role to state governments. Now, uh, what are these two uh, areas of failure as far as COVID-19 is today is concerned? Uh, one is in the failure of the economic response, the economic response of the government uh, in terms of a necessary counter movement to the contraction of the economy in, uh, in the form of what economists call a stimulus has been very, very weak. The government has shown itself extremely reluctant to intervene. Why is this so? Whether it is because the government is purely ideological, it doesn't want to have a large role for government in the economy, for on ideological grounds, or it, it, is it because uh, it is unaware, it does not have the technical competence at the moment, I don't want to get into this issue, but whatever it is, uh, the contraction in the Indian economy uh, is quite significantly related, I would think, if you go by global, global evidence to the 
a st fiscal stimulus, as economists call it, and as you would know, uh, on the part of the government of India, which has been one of the weakest in the world. Uh, and naturally, India has had the biggest contraction among the major economies of the world. So that's the first. The other, of course, is, is not entirely a reflection uh, of the inaction of the central government. The central government has a role. Uh, of, of what we see here is really uh, a, a, a neglect of something very fundamental in India, which is the public health uh, infrastructure or, or the health infrastructure funded uh, from, uh, from public resources. Why do I say that? One of the interesting things is that while the lockdown has been fairly uniform in India, uh, in the sense that at least for 10 weeks it was imposed across the country, the, the fatality or the resistance to COVID has varied very, very widely across the country. Now, I don't want to go into specific details and name states, et cetera, here, but it is significant that some of the richer states in India have, uh, have seen very high mortality and, and some of the not so rich states have seen lower mortality. And it's in, interesting enough, it, with such preliminary data that we have, we're able to relate this very closely to historical levels of, uh, uh, of spending on health in the states. The states remember, uh, or rather health remembers also a so-called state subject in the Indian constitution. Uh, and that's probably partly what reflects uh, this uh, divergence. But having said that, uh, I repeat, uh, the, uh, the the uh, the uh, what can I say? The pattern that the richer states in India may be spending less o o on health is kind of deeply instructive. That it has nothing to do with wealth; it has to do with a certain kind of politics. Uh, 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 after all, public policy reflects politics, uh, and the the, the uh, poorer states have not done so badly, partly because they have historically invested in health. So I think I should, I should broadly end here, but I, and I want to say, uh, 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 you know, uh, the pandemic has exposed like nothing else, uh, the uh, 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 neglect of one aspect, I think, of uh, democracy in India, which is the material condition of the population. Uh, governments have, many governments have uh, uh, invested um, uh, inadequately in health, in terms of health infrastructure. We, uh, we read about uh, right now about uh, the absence of something so basic as oxygen supply in some of the most important uh, 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 you know, metropolitan centers of India. This is quite shocking. Six months into the uh, lockdown, uh, where the lockdown itself was meant to be a, uh, a, an arrangement for equipping ourselves with the necessary uh, necessary. Uh, health infrastructure. Now, I want to uh, complete, uh, since uh, uh, a large number of my organizers, uh, of the organizers of this webinar are uh, Hyderabad-based, I understand. I just want to bring to the attention uh, a, a, a news report I read three days ago in an important uh, or relatively important national news agency or put out by a news agency, which is that of the uh, collector of, uh, the district collector of Guntur, uh, you know, publicly asking for the arrest of a doctor uh, who, who mentioned in a review meeting to which he was invited that there was a shortage of beds in the primary health center that he was in charge of, and it was impossible for him uh, to actually conduct himself in such an environment. I just wish to say that we have uh, uh, a, a, a situation here in India uh, where historically the state uh, in a democracy has not really, uh, you know, concerned itself sufficiently with the health of the population. Uh, and uh, when its role is questioned, uh, has also shown itself, has bared its fangs, if you wish, if I might put it uh, a, a somewhat starkly, uh, which is how I see the, uh, the action uh, or, or, of the representative of the government uh, in the district, which is the district collector. So I, I will uh, com conclude with this, and I, I, I would say that uh, uh, you know I can only hope that this pandemic will uh, lead us to uh, demand more of our democracy than we have. Uh, many people have correctly spoken about the role of the media and also about legislators. Both are very important, 
But something which is, I think, staring at our face right now is the fact that perhaps we, the people, have a major role in ensuring that Indian democracy uh, uh, delivers to us uh, what we expect of it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for you know uh, giving your uh, very very valuable thoughts, and you have really connected the issues uh, you know in this pandemic time, that uh, you know the the democracy we will need democracy more in these times, and we need to strengthen the the values of democracy in the times to come. And you have very rightly connected the issues of uh, health, education, and public participation in this context. And you have also insisted the the need of you know involving the central government and the state government because you know it is the institutional st structure also and it should also percolate to the local you know grassroots level so whatever we have the the local governments at the the you know at the ground level i think that you know it has to percolate from the top to bottom and it has to go up move up from you know the bottom to the the top where the aspirations the concerns and the wishes of the people are reflected in the governance system and you have very rightly, and this is a you know very uh, important and uh, new thing for all of us. You know those who have not uh, uh, you know read the constitution, this uh, you know assembly debates that you have rightly quoted from uh, you know uh, Mr. Nehru uh, that you know where the, the 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 very purpose of independence is to fulfill the aspirations of the people, and I think the democracy, the the uh, the model that we have adopted that will really fulfill those aspirations. Thanks for your very valuable thoughts, sir. Wonderful. Very thankful to you. And now with this, uh, you thank know, you. yes, sir, thank you very much. And with this, now, you know, we are moving ahead with the, the, uh, the question answer session. We are going to open the, the forum and uh, we invite the, uh, the participants as well as the panelists, if you would like to uh, ask questions to our other, uh, you know, panelists, sir. then we can discuss the, the issues uh, in detail now. Now the floor is open for anyone to raise the questions. You can please unmute yourself and you can speak and let the question be very brief and you can identify the speaker also to whom you are posing the question. Uh, can I speak? Please, sir. Yeah, please introduce yourself uh, in one word, uh, you know, one sentence. Pangalla Shiva Prasad Reddy. Yes. I'm a senior journalist. Now I'm hosting a channel titled Dr. TSPR. And uh, I am lucky to host your webinar or seminar live to the entire world. Thank you, sir. And uh, see, I'm a journalist and I've been working since a long time. And my question to uh, the other lawyer who participated, I just forgot her name. Dr. Menaka. Yes, Dr. Menaka. Or else, even I want uh, the Dilip Reddy also to answer. He's a seasoned man. We consider him he's as a yardstick here in journalism because he was a in information commissioner also. Blaming the entire social media for all the ills. How can you? Because I, I run a channel now. I'm a journalist. I'm basically a doctor into journalism. And we go by ethical means and we uh, imbibe the spirit of constitution. We invoke rule of law and we invoke the evidence act also in all my shows. What they don't understand, when we are doing this, we have become a soft target of the regimes, right from top to bottom, central to state governments. And we are trying to bring out what is happening in the society, in the contemporary, all the contemporary happenings or times. So this social media is the only one which has come to the rescue of a common man in times of pandemic. Now, this is going to be the lead of the day. That's what they have designated even Westerners. They said this is a web world. Definitely. The other side of the coin is also we have to understand. But why don't you understand the importance of the social media and people like us, seasoned journalists who have been practicing since a long time, bringing all those issues into the public domain so that the governments act. Right, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Dilip Reddy, sir, can answer the question because the lawyer has left already. She yeah, yeah. came in between. Yes. Sir, I would like to uh, present that issue in this way. Uh, as Jokumar Reddy uh, 
Shwa Prasad Reddy has rightly mentioned that we we cannot uh, ignore or we cannot defame a social media platform, but at the same time, as uh, uh, advocate uh, uh, rightly mentioned that uh, there are there are no editors, there are no gatekeepers, there are no the people who takes accountability for the accuracy of the news. Uh, if that goes into the public domain, automatic the powerful people will definitely use. those social media platforms has the propaganda instruments in that context it is the conventional media's duty to become that whenever the fake news comes into the uh, public domain it has to be checked and it must be exposed and uh, accordingly the credibility of uh, such social media platforms which occasionally and repeatedly popularizing that the fake news into uh, pushing into the public domain will lose the credibility and uh, uh, some balance we will definitely gain over a period of time but definitely just one rider to this now the conventional media links are the ones in the social media which have been causing all this whether it is a mumbai issue or the other issue we are the ones here through this channel we have seen to that only the basic issues which have evidence or which are public concern we make people to speak but it is the conventional media links which are destroying the ethics of social media how do you look at this sir i am i am not in a position to defend the entire conventional media as the right media but over a period of time they also lost their ting their, their, their tendency of investigating and searching for truth and uh, and working for only truth not nothing uh, beyond the truth Uh, that uh, tendency is uh, slowly going down but it is now the time for even conventional media either it is mutual dependence and inter interdependence that uh, uh, social media sometimes picking certain news from the conventional media and conventional media without even cross checking uh, blindly taking uh, the content from the social media uh, this is unhealthy for the uh, larger interest of society everything must be uh, with proper cross checking and uh, ascertaining the truth and truth only should come into the public domain that is my uh, concern thank you sir i think venka's point was uh, uh, you know one is she has analyzed this camp of uh, social media but how social media is being used by uh, mainstream parties in shaping and uh, increasing the fault lines you know basically that's what uh, her thrust has been she mentioned uh, how in america uh, you know white supremacism is being channeled through social media so i think uh, like any media uh, social media or mainstream media conventional media i think they are being used uh, though they are democratic tools i think these tools have become uh, again a tool for uh, you know power mongering i think that's the point uh, i understood thank you sir yeah thank you and can we go to the next question anyone would like to please introduce yourself and uh, pose the question and any panelists would like to ask questions to other panelists if there is no one i have one <laughs> yes sir yeah please go ahead yes. because narsimha reddy has been part of our campaign we have been trying to sustain truth as dilip reddy garu but how difficult it to sustain truth me and narsimha reddy garu we are all very well aware how in your issue also could not go into the public domain but for the investments made by all those frontline political parties they have different wings they will try to nullify even the truth can i pose a uh, question to professor pushottam reddy varu is he yes sir because is my guru now in this this is the day for democracy so what do youngsters and people like us who are into media 
even in spite of representing at various fora with all legal evidences legitimately if the concerned governments or departments do not act ana please repeat sir namaskar thankful to you you have allowed me to <laughs> telecast such a wonderful webinar what should people like us and youngsters do when in spite of representing with legal evidences very legitimately to either the government or the government concerned departments whether it is central state or for that matter let me say election commission of india that is so crucial for the people participating constitutional democracy yeah yeah it's a very important question actually the citizens of india are in a dilemma as uh, we very often comment about what is our idea of india i mean uh, what was the promise uh, of the constituent assembly and where do we stand today uh, we have uh, dr balakrishnan garu and uh, dr pushpa kumar garu i request both of them to comment because sometimes uh, we get a feeling that uh, the idea of india or the vision of india which uh which was the aspiration of the people of india at the time of making of the constitution that vision is coming becoming increasingly blurred and uh, we notice of course uh, we, we already experienced emergency during uh, mrs indira gandhi time and now there is definitely something like an emergency happening in every state you know democracy is the very antithesis of dynasty but what are we witnessing in our states today every state is in the grip of maybe two or three dynasties and uh, the power sh shifts only between the dynasties and uh, where where are the people so sometimes we get a feeling that this is a okay fine we have a constitutional democracy we have naam ke vaste elections are there election commission is which is supposed to be autonomous it refuses to discharge its duties and the you know particularly in telangana the election commission works as a <laughs> uh, to his majesty's uh, law it sometimes it appears it is more loyal to the state government than to the people where do we stand i request uh, professor balakrishnan garu to because this is the dilemma sir in our state and what is the election commission an ordinary ias officer becomes a election in charge of the election commission he is not accountable to the constitution he doesn't perform his duties and uh, you know several things go wrong one example i want to clarify political parties in india they openly speak about caste and religion and you know uh, everything including uh, region and every and it is the duty of the election commission to rectify to discipline the political parties why why is the election commission a mute witness to the ongoing onslaught on de on democracy by uh, all political parties including national parties we see the same dynasty uh, manifesting in the second largest party that is congress and at the at the regional level it is horrible sometimes i get a feeling that india is in the grip of certain uh, princely states in a different form please i request um, dr balakrishnan garu to clarify <clears throat> sir i i really don't think I, <laughs> i have the knowledge to answer this uh, but i i want to start by saying uh, uh, how struck i am by the fact that in this audience so many people before me and now uh, professor prashodham reddy uh, have spoken about the state governments it's rather fashionable to focus purely in what is happening at the center i think we certainly should be worried seriously about what is happening at the center we've had a government for about 6 years which have you know neither given us you know uh, national security nor uh, any kind of uh, economic stability uh but still i would think that we need to worry deeply about what is happening at the level of the states uh, to say that has become slightly politically incorrect in progressive circles because there's a 
in Delhi, there is a certain kind of consensus that, uh, you know, the state governments seem to be the kind of, what can I say, paragon of virtue, while they're democratic, progressive, all the rest of it. But, uh, you know, we should focus purely on the central government. I don't take that view. I think the central government should be put seriously under scrutiny, but we should, we ultimately live in the states. What is happening in the states is what matters to us. And I'm uh, struck by what was said by the spe previous speakers. There's a, what is happening in the states is a travesty of democracy. That's completely correct. I mean, uh, right. Now, having said that, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure I'm really in a position to answer. Uh, I mean, in the sense that I don't have the knowledge to talk about uh, the election commission, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, do I just add a small point to that? Uh, you know, uh, I understand the election commission has no financial restraints also. As an economist, that's something which strikes me. So now <laughs> you neither have financial restraints, nor are you accountable. This is a deadly combination. <laughs> anyway, I just want to go back to this uh, very important point, and I want to stop, which was raised by uh, uh, Professor Pushodam Reddy, uh, which is that uh, of the Constituent Assembly. And I think that's extremely important to us. And we should be, we should be thinking about that very seriously. There are, there, are, uh, there are concerns about whether the Constituent Assembly was completely representative. Those are very serious questions. But I, I would say on balance, when you look at what they produced, it's extremely impressive. And what do they have in mind? I mean, I just... Uh, uh, want to talk about two people. I've already spoken about Nehru and uh, spoken about uh, his view about political institutions and our task in independent India was to create political institutions which allow people to lead fulfilling lives. Yeah, so that's very important. Now, if you think that it's a bit too abstract and general, let me say something which he said before that, which is probably the third or the fourth line of the, of, of the much recorded speech uh, on the midnight of August 1447. Uh, he said that independence is but the opportunity uh, to, to uh, uh, create or build, I think is the word that he used, build a prosperous, democratic, and progressive. Now, I don't want to put too much emphasis on the order in which he, uh, he used those terms, but... Nehru did use the term prosperous first. Now, does that mean that we just want an, uh, you know, a, a situation of affluence? Absolutely not. It just means that people have prosperity. The, the people are well off. They have the basics of life. And we need to worry about that and not constantly be worried about whether a, a, a thought is progressive in some sense, in the form of having Desh Bhakti, nationalism, secularism, all of which are absolutely important for India. Nobody would say no. But you can't really build a country purely on the basis of, of notions of progressive thought. You have to have a people who have capabilities. And Nehru, who certainly was, a, even in the Constitution, Constitution, Constitution Assembly was not representative. I think you ne needed to have a certain amount of property to be a, a member of the Constituent Assembly. There were very few women. Uh, there were very few people other than the uppermost caste, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the Constituent Assembly, you may say, was not very representative. But Nehru certainly at that time uh, had the, uh, uh, you know, was speaking on behalf of the people of India. Uh, I, I can't think of any other politician at that time who really had the credibility to do so. And this somehow has gone out of the window today in debates about democracy. Uh, 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 and the whole thing is about which party represents the democracy uh, more, etc. Always a very important. We want our political parties to be democratic, but we should also be concerned about the condition of our people. And I do believe the Constituent Assembly did pay a lot of attention to that issue. Somewhere at the center and the states, that has seemed to have uh, gone out of the window uh, based on notions of today, uh, nationalism at the center. And for, for, for decades of the state, about um, asmita, uh, pride, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we seem to have been diverted, in my view, uh, from the whole point of the national movement. And I, I think Professor Reddy is correct to say that we should be drawn to back to that question, uh, which is perhaps even more important than uh, discussing democracy in the abstract, which, of course, also needs to be done. Thank you very much. I've taken a little longer than I should. Thank you, sirs.
Or I think uh, you know you your question about election commission. It's not only election commission. As I mentioned, there is a fusion of private and public. So even in elections, now we see a lot of private players at the back. So uh, whatever you see at the front is only a public election commission. I think. So the, in that sense, the competency of uh, the statutory institutions headed by IAS officer in responding to the current level of uh, democratic participation is completely low. So there we are bringing private players and private players are, of course, you know, they have their own uh, uh, profit making motive. So yeah, that's how the data last election I think the personal data coming from welfare uh, uh, schemes have been used by all the ruling parties to influence the voters. So the, the you know the you know the conventional uh, you know factors which you mentioned caste and religion apart. Uh, you know there are new uh, kind of factors which are brought in uh, using the personal data. But uh, where is the law? I, I think. The interpretation of election uh, regulation code is uh, still, I think, 20 years old. So they are not yet uh, looked into this aspect, even though there is evidence that uh, in Andhra Pradesh elections and uh, uh, other elections, uh, uh, ruling parties are using personal data to influence the voters. So I think uh, uh, the competency is also a question and. Uh, Increasingly, I think we should talk of multiple headed uh, uh, statutory institutions rather than a single person headed institution. Because, I mean, that's where at least we will have some uh, protection uh, for democratic uh, principles. Let me add a word. The ambiguity we see in these IAS officers, there in AP, the government is troubled. Here you see the government is very comfortable, the ruling party. The ambiguity in both the functioning of the IAS officers in both the states that questions the independence. Uh, as Narsana rightly said, that not only uh, use, misuse, abuse of uh, uh, public data by the political parties, uh, very close to the polling date. One political party head who is sitting in the chair of uh, uh, chief minister, he openly said that uh, when our party people wants to spend some money uh, for electoral uh, people, voters, uh, the income tax people are coming and preventing. So that's why I molded these public programs to give you money straight away. Uh, 2000 per head, uh, 3000 per head. I am giving this money to you by molding these programs uh, as for your benefit at the time of elections. No election commission initiated any action against that politician. That's the ambiguity. What is the independence of the election commission and uh, such a uh, pivotal institutions in democracy? That's the ambiguity we find in Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. That's what I'm bringing it to the notice of the well known. If the constitutional people participatory democracy has to prevail all these enticements, which are against the spirit of the basic structure of the framework of our constitution, free and fair election. That has to go. How has it to be manned? As you rightly said, statutory should be not single IAS officer manning it. We need to have people in that body. But even if that also gets, then how can this democracy survive? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I think we should listen to Dr. Indra Sena Reddy. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, in, in this subject, I'm uh, not uh, so uh, uh, perfect to say anything in front of you all, uh, uh, you know, big uh, tall wars, um, star wars. But one thing, a couple of things I can certainly add is that earlier, you know, first of all, we always uh, you know, make uh, statements, um, you know, proudly that it is the biggest uh, democratic, uh, you know, system in the world. You know, it's good that uh, we are happy and we always uh, can, can claim. But only one problem used to have is the dynastic way of ruling, but somehow, 
because of that patience which we practiced under the you know uh, leadership of britishers that we are continuing uh, rather opposing the dynasty but in addition to that when the dynastic politics are you know slowly uh, fading up uh, step by step the power of you know in the, in the financial power the politics uh, and electoral uh, system is influencing the um, you know uh, this uh, uh, financial support so with uh, clubbing this uh, uh, electoral system is weakening uh, as uh, somebody mentioned that uh, you know phase wise it is diluting though we claim it as a you know biggest democratic and the system electoral system but it is not really in practice only on paper otherwise it's not required to have an election polling for two months no we cannot conduct in a single day or even two days or three days in this country of course it is the biggest country and the huge population that i understand but um, the system is uh, we cannot claim that is uh, we have a perfect system so that these things are uh, combinedly is diluting our uh, these uh, democratic policies democratic system electoral democratic system and uh, i was afraid that at one day or other day in future unless we realize and we will work on this electoral politics Uh, reducing the money power and all, so certainly then the southern states uh, uh, removing this dynastic dynastic policies dynastic systems then certainly we have in danger in future uh, that's what i would like to say very good sir if i may add a point uh, i think you know uh, mr indra sena sir has you know highlighted one issue why this dynasty politics you know thrives in this country Uh, one reason is that to enter into politics or to fl- flourish in politics in the in the country, more than integrity or the the talents or the education or any the willingness to serve the people, more than any of these qualifications, the first qualification in the country seems to be money and muscle power. I think you know, as long as this is continuing, then the genuine uh, you know uh, people who want to serve the country. Who want to become? Because you know we have seen many leaders. You know they have they have come with their knowledge. They have come with their commitments. For example, Sir has, uh, uh, you know, Professor Balakrishna has, uh, you know, stated, you know, uh, uh, named a few, uh, you know, uh, the stalwarts at that time, who have served the country with the help of their knowledge and their commitments. Of Sir Vipali Radhakrishnan, one, you know, he is a knowledge epitome of knowledge, and how he has served the country. And you know, uh, 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 people like you know Gandhi Ji, Nehru, all these people, you know, they have. They have, they, they have not come with money only they have come with uh, you know the uh, uh, the intellectual capabilities the real willingness to work and here if you or i have this thing we will not be uh, having any place in politics so i think you know we have created even though we have uh, carefully uh, adopted the democratic system and the checks and balances are also created in the country it is not that you know we are not having safeguards the constitutional framework has it we have sufficient laws to have checks and balances but unfortunately the cultural and the social uh, you know the 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 habits as well as the the institutions that we have built that leans in favor of uh, the power and the money and it is because of that you know uh, the the voice is also not uh, being raised against that and uh, the dynasties because of their power you know they get away with that i think you know this is one aspect that you know we need to look at how the individuals and the people they realize this point and they become uh, the major voice to uh, restructure the the whole democratic setup i think because you know now i see silver lines here and there uh, you know uh, individual organizations uh, people come forward to create this awareness engage the people and get into the participatory a moments so one one example i see that you know harsh has you know how he has uh, you know aligned the people from different uh, you know uh, uh, corners of the country in uh, eaa and uh, the good work done by the the you know green foundation here uh, how you are uh, you know dealing with that 
so like that the the non governmental organizations and the people have to come up they should first understand create understanding among the people and then engage into the politics and that is where you know you can change the dynastic uh, rule otherwise it won't be possible because you know it is there it is going to stay there and moreover i feel as a teacher i feel that you know we when we grew up we used to see lots of you know role models the same election commission problem that you are raising sir it is very true but you know we used to see people like you know uh, you know the uh, mr t n sheshan you know such a integrity you know in you know, integrity he used to hold and no one could uh, you know uh, dare uh, to say anything against him because of the integrity and because of the commitment and he used the power legally he used the power and uh, and also in the press in the context of the press as we have discussed now that you know uh, the the press being you know leaning towards the the corporates and the press being leaning towards the government and the independent voice is lost now in most of the 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 channels that we watch or most of the the newspapers or the magazines we read you know we don't really have that independent voices i could see that you know when i was uh, you know a student uh, i could uh, uh, see the stalwarts like uh, goenka you know see where are such independent voices we have where are those role models i think you know we need to inspire the the youth now to create such you know the independent courageous role models to you know uh, reconstruct the country the values are already there the structures are already there what we lack is that the wherewithals you know you know how we are going to refuel the system to reculture you know reconstruct the whole you know, the, the democratic uh, system that we have visualized we are now having the skeleton only so but inside it is hollow so how we are going to stuff it up with uh, good stuff and values that's what is the major challenge as a teacher i see sir Sir, uh, only one one minute i'll take yes, i wish to thank uh, pushpa kumar garu yes for his time and the way he conducted the proceedings thank you very much sir yes. and uh, also dr shiva prasad reddy because he, uh, his channel through his channel we are able to reach millions worldwide uh, thank you very much uh, shiva your contribution to democracy is acknowledged and uh, our young uh, harsh bedi as an environmental activist i would like to be in touch with you uh, we'll have uh, further discussion on uh, eia my friend dr narsimha reddy uh, you know we are all there for this subject of environment and in future we'll work with you and uh, uh, sir uh, balakrishnan garu <laughs> sir i have uh, one uh, not a question but uh, my concern dr pushpa kumar yes sir recently i was um, here um, i mean uh, us and we have a small conference uh, video conferences are going on regarding on several issues mm -hmm. uh, repeatedly i heard very recently the the kind of implementation or uh, rather i should say that uh, you know the growing of these different departments or uh, for example in media and uh, you know economical situation other things and all um, the increasing uh, their capabilities but the judicial system is not coming up uh, either in rnd or the bringing up the new laws are uh, destroying the old and unused uh, useless laws mm -hmm. and um, like any other department any other arms of the democracy or arms of the system of any country for example the judicial is not coming up that's what their comment or their uh, you know uh, discussion for, for, uh, issue so do you have anything to say on that just briefly you mean to say that if i if i understand the question correctly sir i think that the, the judiciary is not coming up to the expectations and it is not yes. contributing towards you know uh, rather i can use this uh, raw word is upgrading i should say that. there are several other arms of the system is upgrading in a different way yes. the new things like a uh, social media and uh, you know electronic uh, and these uh, it and these are coming up but the judicial is not taking the help of these other arms are upgrading itself mm -hmm. yes sir yeah so i will uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, give my view on that definitely actually judiciary you know is one of the pillars of this uh, democracy in the governance setup 
and uh, we have very high hopes on that it has been doing uh, you know whatever you know uh, uh, you know it has to fulfill uh, those obligations it has been doing sir so judiciary as an institution it has really lived up to the expectations and it has been it has been uh, you know providing very trend setting judgments in several cases but as an institution critically if you look at is it really evolving is it really becoming uh, you know the the torch bearer of uh, uh, the whole governance system that upholds the people's rights and uh, you know duties and also promotes uh, the the whole uh, the national development and there i think you know it lacks uh, some systemic failures the systemic failures one of the thing is that the appointment of a judges in the judiciary itself is flawed by several systems and where it is very much resistant to adopt any new mechanisms uh in it wants to you know have its own say in the appointments and that is where we see that you know sometimes uh you know uh, undesirable things happening uh you know we are not able to and and the the right people who have to be on the on the the judiciary are also not able to get into so the system is so very much uh, you know uh within uh, the, the very few hands so that is one aspect that it is bothering the legal community everyone and how to reform the uh, the judicial appointments that's one thing sir secondly there are lots of you know i should not say this but you know uh, we uh, we don't have concrete uh, evidences to uh, prove such things but you know most often there has been an accusation that you know the influence of the of the government uh, uh, penetrating into the judicial system and uh, getting into the 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 pronouncements so that uh, and also influence of the 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 corporates and uh, other vested interest and i think you know it becomes very much uh, disturbing we also see some messages here and there coming up that you know this really erodes the confidence and the values of the judicial system i think you know this thing has to be you know eradicated from the the whole scenario wherein you know that should be a clean judiciary where you know it upholds the, the rule of law rule of law is the basic root of uh, the the democracy so that has to be upheld so uh, th- th- these are some criticisms i think you know the judiciary itself is worried many judges are coming out openly and telling but uh, it is uh, struggling to overcome number one number two i think technologically it is improving now your case like you know like other uh, media other areas are improving why the, the judiciary is not improving but on that count i see that uh, judiciary is really improving well uh, the they are now opening uh, the e courts uh, e filing e arguments so wherein you know earlier it was not happening but you know with the uh, before the covid era also you know they, there were uh, you know examples in delhi high court and other high courts and the supreme courts they slowly opened up for the uh, the electronic um, uh, you know the the argument you know the usage of uh, you know the e facilities now after the pandemic happened i think uh, the the court is transforming itself so the e filing e arguments are uh, you know now it has become norm of the day so i think this is going to uh, improve a lot in the the judicial uh, system but there i think they have to have some kind of checks and balances and uh, some kind of a quality control where you know um, wherever the cases where they have to interact with the people interact with the evidences interact with the uh, the the plaintiff and the defendant or the the accused and that possibility should not be ignored should not be taken away and that possibility because it is uh, completely you cannot do justice uh, through electronic means so only when you look at the people the empathy and sympathy also makes a way for you know providing good justice i remember justice vr krishna here how he has delivered this judgments it's not only bla- in the, the 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 black letter law and he looks at the human face and he looks at the the needs of the people and he le- delivered the judgments uh, you know to their you know uh, needs and that's where the, the all his judgments are time tested now so i think you know this possibility should not be ruled out so in that case technology is really taking strides in the uh, judicial process that is improving but there are lots of improvements uh, as you have highlighted uh, should happen we all should uh, you know work for that sir shall i add one thing sir please mention about open courts where in you yes. can have the measure of one's feelings and let me quote uh, bv acharya garu 
I got, I'm lucky to host him the other day on limitations of parliament to amend. When you bring the basic structure or framework of constitution into play and you uphold Shivananda Bharati or whatever it is, when such is the case, he said, even why not judiciary should be under scrutiny of the same basic structure. He said the 99th amendment, as you rightly said, judicial appointment committee, which is still on hold, that should be the one which should reform. That's what he's, he was saying. Once this 99th amendment is approved by the Supreme Court, who has to approve again the Supreme Court. So they should not be moving away from the same basic structure through which they could uphold Shivananda Bharati's case, which has become the main yardstick for at least the functional democracy in India. And if they have to rise above that, that 99th am uh, amendment, that has to come into place. Otherwise, as you rightly said, the same thing, only two or three in a quorum, they will be appointing high court judges and the same will sit and they will appoint themselves again. This is what, yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you meant the Keshwananda Bharti case. Sorry, Keshwananda Bharti case. Thank you. Yes. I was quoting uh, B.B. Acharya. Right. Very good. Yes. So in that case, you know, the, uh, the Supreme Court has given, you know, very, uh, you know, human service to the country, you know, by delivering very good judgments. Even recently, you have seen that several important judgments like 377 judgment, uh, privacy case judgment, uh, you know, the, the contribution is coming up so well, the jurisprudence is being developed so well by the judiciary, there is no doubt about it. But the systemic issues also we should look at. Okay. Yeah, yes. the transparency should be there. Still, it is not under the RTI, you know. So, so there are many things, you know, we need to look at. 99th Amendment, Judicial Commission Appointment Committee. Hmm. AC, A, that's what he said. Yes. That comes into play. He said all the things can be removed and it will function independently. Yes. Or else, as you rightly said, you have to kneel towards one or the other side. Yes. Thanks a lot. I think, you know, we are uh, now coming to the end of the program. If uh, any of the, the, uh, the panel speakers, if you would like to add one sentence, last sentence, or uh, one final takeaway from all of you, I'll be very happy to, you know, hear that. Then we will uh, go to the concluding part. Thank sir. you very much, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> sir, any final takeaway from you, sir? The last keyword. Yes. May I, may I speak? Yes, please. Ash. Uh, very sorry. <clears throat> I, I just wanted to say, first of all, um, I just wanted to thank Professor Pushottam Reddy and you for the recognition. Also, I, I wanted to add that it's, it's indeed been a privilege to be a part of this discussion with all the speakers who are here. I want to build on something that you said in terms of um, young people coming to the front and serving their country. I think quite simply, there is a lot of willingness on our part uh, to come forward and to serve our nation. But at the same time, you know, I, I spoke about technology and I think the way that I spoke towards the end may betray some youthful optimism that things would improve and get better. And I want to maintain that optimism. <clears throat> but I also want to add that technology is just a tool and it's only as good or as bad as the people who end up using it. So even as young people come to the fore, we need, we need guidance. We need guidance from people like you who have the experience, who have the vision, <clears throat> who, can, who can show us the way forward and how we can make the kind of changes that we want to. So towards that, I, I look forward, for instance, for, for working with Professor Pushottam Reddy on the environment and uh, related laws and with you. And again, I just want to say thank you to everybody for, um, for extending this opportunity to be a part of this. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. You. Yeah, we are privileged to have you, Harsh, here. Okay, you're a role model. Thanks a lot. We will engage and we'll work more. Yes. yes. I just uh, I welcome uh, Harsh Pedi's uh, uh, intentions. And uh, as far as the judiciary is concerned, only one sentence I wish to say. That judiciary, uh, Indian judiciary is uh, really progressive. It has done a great job. It gives extraordinary landmark judgments, but never bothers to see whether they are complied with or not. In, they give extraordinary judgments, but they don't bother to see whether their orders are complied with or not. 
can they create a facility within the supreme court to monitor the compliance of their orders this is only we, this will be the topic for our next webinar because we need to come together we need to have a round table on the working of india's constitution and we have to invite a large number of youngsters we have to i mean their aspirations also has to be taken note of and uh, i am not uh, very happy with the working of india's constitution because definitely the corporates have penetrated every aspect of india and it is not just election commission every institution in this country is virtually in the grip of the corporates and it's a very sad day so we have to come together we need to have a review of the working of the constitution and we need to find remedies because if we do not do it the coming generations will not forgive us narsana please thank you sir uh, thank you i saw uh, and democracy has always been under threat uh, even before uh, you know through bureaucracy red tapeism uh, then subsequently we are looking at a threat from law itself law and the legal interpretation of uh, uh, you know rule of law so in that same uh, direction we see science and technology being used to distort uh, democracy so science uh, instead of being a knowledge uh, uh, source it has become a tool uh, to you know profit uh, so few people profiting from it and uh, then this start democracy so uh, i think uh, this will be overcome because as uh, harsh said uh, young people uh, they have never been exposed to restriction before and uh, during covid uh, for the first time they found that uh, their life can be restricted even technologically and physically so i think uh, now the urge to be free is increasing i think only that will uh, save uh, democracies and uh, democracy thank you so uh, Dilip Reddy, sir, uh, would you like to? Sir, uh, only thing I would like to uh, add that we uh, today participants from different corners of the society representing uh, different uh, uh, institutions like uh, media one side, uh, public policy other side, and the environment professor. So we, we, as long as we all uh, uh, will contribute uh, something for the strengthening of democracy. in turn democracy will definitely deliver and create a space where uh, like harsh bedi is asking for a space some space should be provided even for the youth as you invited to come into the mainstream politics the eternal vigilance uh, is the price we need to pay to get our benefits our liberty our democracy we are to strengthen the democracy that that's only my appeal from this thank you thank you sir so i think you know this comes to the the close of the the program i'm very very happy you know to uh, you know i know uh, you know thank uh, you know the the speakers who have taken their time and sharing their very very valuable views on this occasion of uh, you know international day for democracy uh, i would like to on behalf of the the organizers yes jaipal reddy memorial foundation capital foundation society council for green revolution and mandate project i would like to conclude this uh, webinar and this program really you know this itself is a uh, you know an evidence that the organizations coming from different places and looking at different issues are coming to strengthen democracy we know that how sri jaipal reddy sir has you know uh, led his whole life defending and you know serving for the the cause of uh, democracy and that jaipal reddy memorial foundation is part of this program you know program it is organizing capital foundation society which was indeed started by justice v r krishna iyer and mr vinod sethi you now he is the leader now you know who is uh, you know uh, uh, organizing several programs to you know promote the values of constitutionalism and the democracy and we thank uh, vinod sethi sir uh, you know on this occasion 
and the council for green revolution has been doing yeoman service uh, for the cause of environment sustainable development and we thank mr uh, lakshma reddy mr dilip reddy karu for uh, you know being with us and organizing uh, such a program and uh, mr uh, harsh bedi uh, you know the founder of uh, the mandate project is here and uh, he is also you know part of this program and uh, all these organizations have you know provided the space to discuss the the importance of uh, democracy in the today's uh, covid context so i take also the privilege of uh, thanking all the distinguished uh, you know uh, panelists uh, professor uh, uh, k purushottam reddy sir very renowned uh, you know uh, the the, uh, the policy analyst uh, and uh, political scientist and his contribution to environment is also very big and he is also member of the the capital foundation society he represents uh, that society also we thank you sir for uh, your uh, valuable inputs and uh, your uh, kind time and uh, we would like to thank dr menaka guruswami dr uh, dunti narsimha reddy um, um, mr uh, dilip reddy sir uh, shri uh, harsh bedi and professor uh, balakrishnan sir for their valuable time their inputs and uh, the, the very stimulating views that you have uh, you know shared with us with our participants uh, in this uh, you know webinar i would like to also thank all the participants uh, who have uh, you know uh, taken the time to be part of us and they have also shared very good questions uh, so we thank everyone particularly mr uh, shiva prasad reddy uh, you know for his uh, very good uh, you know interventions uh, that's really very helpful so with this i would like to uh, you know uh, wind up this program i think democracy is the the biggest hope for all of us there is no doubt we, we all only make the democracy we all you know we need to strengthen democracy so unless you know our participation is not 100 percentage and uh, democracy will be in danger so i think we will live up to that expectations thank you very much one and all